Rashid also knows him. So we had a very wonderful uh, kind of a uh, interaction during uh, uh, his Pune's uh, visit, where we could uh, get to know him as a person. Because when we are a student and teacher, that time the interactions are not that uh, much between uh, the two people. But I could come to know about him. Uh, what a wonderful person he is when uh, we interacted in Pune and how jolly he can be, which was contrastingly different when we were in the department. So uh, at that time when I was in the department, he had a, a charismatic figure, always has an impression uh, when he teaches. He has a sound impression on all the students uh, whom he would have taught, but I personally feel he had a great impression on me as a teacher, how one should prepare his class, and uh, other steps, how to train basically students to do good uh, in their life and how to uh, make them aware about uh, uh, what they should do for uh, their career uh, advancement. So that was one thing he would always stress on, uh, stressing students to uh, prepare for net or uh, making them uh, basically that capable so that uh, they can uh, qualify uh, net. So one of the examples that happened with NCL Pune was that he had given a lecture in some other research group. And when the student from uh, one of the students came out uh, from that group, she told me, now we know how you are that much uh, good in chemistry because you have got teachers like this. But then I said to her that not all teachers are like uh, uh, Dr. Rizvi. <laughs> not everybody is like that, but uh, some are, uh, they, they master the art of teaching. And of course, uh, this is for all of us. If you have to master the art of teaching, you have to put effort into it. Like people put effort into their research. If you won't put effort into teaching, you won't be a good teacher. Not at all. You have to dedicate time and uh, seeing by that, he would have definitely dedicated a lot of time to his uh, to improve his art, uh, to become such a uh, name in teaching. And that has earned him awards at uh, the university level also. He has been awarded an excellent teacher award by the uh, uh, Dika. Uh, also, uh, he has picked up his research activities recently and he has currently more than uh, 65 research articles to his name in good uh, and reputed journals. Uh, with this brief introduction, uh, I would like Dr. Rizvi to share his, or Professor Rizvi to share his uh, slides and uh, deliver the talk. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mansoor. It's uh, overwhelmingly uh, enough to uh, say more uh, in the capacity of my uh, erstwhile student. And uh, it has also put me on a pressure of finding that I should stand by your words, uh, which you have spoken about. And uh, I, I hope I can do justice to the part. Uh, being a teacher is definitely one of the pleasureful jobs, uh, if you mean to be. Uh, but it's also uh, very sticky and addictive you know, which uh, normally people are not uh, comfortable with. So I always fear in my presentations that uh, I may not uh, over ambish things uh, in a way that uh, they become more like uh, a classroom teaching. So I, uh, please excuse me for that if it happens uh, in this presentation as well. But uh, I hope that uh, I have put some uh, break points wherein uh, we can actually quit uh, as and when we find the chance of uh, getting in uh, a stretch point. So uh, at the outset, thank you very much uh, for uh, such uh, a detailed uh, and elaborate uh, words. Uh, I'd uh, like to thank uh, the organizing committee or uh, team of this uh, workshop uh, on a very apt topic of modern tools and techniques in chemical sciences. Uh, it's more of an analytical and a well-themed uh, uh, workshop, uh, which uh, has been organized right from uh, the uh, top level with uh, Professor Ram Shu as the Vice Chancellor and my rival teacher, Professor Arthur Sir, uh, Manzoor, and all the uh, dynamic young faculty of the department. Uh, my congratulations to each one of you for this. And uh, to cater to the theme of the title, which is uh, broadly around uh, what we call as uh, analytical chemistry. So I I was like in a fix what to talk about because uh, many things might have been there. And uh, finding that we are doing it in an on online mode via the COVID kind of condition. So I thought uh, I'll be speaking about uh, the topic which is analytical monitoring of compound biotarget interaction. 
a leading step towards drug development. So it would be broadly about drug development, uh, but it will also cater to the analytical things. Of course, uh, uh, if I can say that uh, the lecture is segmented into four uh, components, the first component being need for drug development, uh, the second component being uh, what we call as how to guess the molecules uh, that have the potential to be taken as drugs. Uh, I think uh, Manzoor and other people will like that part. And the third is uh, the body of this particular topic. That is, uh, how do we, uh, what are the analytical ways by which we can uh, work out, establish uh, qualitatively as well as quantitatively the compound biotarget interaction? Uh, and finally, uh, towards the end, in the fourth segment, we will uh, I will share some of the works which we have done uh, in this particular direction over the recent years. So uh, need for drug development is the first segment which we'll be speaking about. Why do we need drugs? Uh, let's uh, have a little fun type of uh, thing with it. No one can answer this question betterly than ourselves, uh, finding why do we need drug development? It's because that one of the finest things that we have all of us as a lifetime achievement award, like, is that we all are till now being graded as COVID survivors. We'll be calling ourselves as a lifetime achievement that we have been COVID survivors. And deep down the line, if you talk to your great grandchildren of finding that there was a global pandemic and we survived it, they will say, hey, granny, or hey, uh, grandpa, you had immunity. So it's like a compliment and it's like a lifetime achievement of being a COVID survivor. Now, this COVID times, what did they teach us? They teach us one of the very important things which uh, focuses on drug development. We all have felt it. We have not learned it. We have felt it. We have seen the times when COVID came and everything was put to a halt. We have seen the global lockdown. We have seen the fall of economy. We have seen every such thing. We have even seen the fear of meeting people. We have even seen how do parents scare their children to meet them if they have the apprehension of they may be the positive. We have, we have seen how the things were like under a lockdown and why this whole thing was there. It was there just because we did not have a drug. Had we had a drug for a disease like COVID, maybe the fear, maybe the problems, maybe the lockdown, maybe the economic losses would have not been to this much. And another very important aspect which COVID has learned, uh, I mean, uh, taught us is that the drug development, how much time and tedious it is. If we recollect over last few uh, years, since we are facing this pandemic, we know for odd eight to nine months, we did not have any analytical method to detect the disease. And thanks to analytical chemistry or the analytical monitoring or the analytical techniques which first identified the glycoproteins or the spike proteins of the organism, and then developed the tests which eventually got into rat testing, et cetera. And once the testing phase was over, then there was the second challenge which took nearly a year and a half for uh, getting the vaccine. And if statistically I sound correct, we said that this is one of the fastest approved vaccine, which not only people are accepting heavily, but at the same time, they are getting the fake certificates to see that they are COVID vaccinated, fearing that what would be the aftermath, what would be the sort of side effects. So they are not accepting it heartedly, finding that it's one of the fastest approved drugs. COVID also let us know, which I often uh, say in my meeting to the students, like every science can wait, except for the biological science. You see, when the COVID came up, none of the scientists, whatever walk of science they belong to, be that the mathematicians, which have the negative values of numbers, be that the quantum people who are in a meta world, be that the astronomists, 
who think of stars, be that the literature people who know the philosophy of life, nobody was uh, saved out of it. Everybody was taken to the fear of finding that I should not catch the disease because it's, there's no restriction that the COVID will not happen to theoreticians. The COVID will not happen to quantum mechanics people like Manzoor and all that. Everybody is vulnerable because everybody is a human machine. And everyone, whatever specialization he has, what was his only demand? What he was looking for? He was looking for something to be called as drug. And you see whole science, you, I may not sound exaggerating if this is correct, that even NASA had to stop its activity for a fairly good period of time so that they were fearing that the COVID will not take on to the scientists and all that. So we say drug development is essential. We know it and we not only learn it, we felt it over these period of time. And there's another funny part to it. When we don't have the drug, we resort to superstition. You know, on a platform like this, we don't know many of the EDC or superstition things have happened, like starting from the ringing, uh, ringing of bells to the lighting of candles or to the beating of plates, or even if we take the American president saying that if it can do it on hands, why it can't do it in the lungs, you know, the disinfectant. If... So all that comes up to say that drug development is one of the challenging things, especially for the disease which we are confronting right now. And even the second part is preparedness towards emerging diseases. Many people will come across this observation saying that there are more frequent diseases these days than it would have been in the previous times, be that by virtue of metabolic disorders, be that by virtue of something like food habits, whatever. You know, people prepare before the pandemic, if you remember, they prepare for H1N1 vaccination right start at the autumn, finding that they may should have, you know, because the diseases are confronting very fast or they are a newer, newer disease. On a preparedness towards emerging disease, one of my scientific friends, he made a very nice joke. And he said that in the older days, when it were marriage settlements between the people, they were asked about their property, they were asked about something. And today, one more dimension has added to that issue. And you know what is that dimension? The bride and groom are asking each other, do you have an Aishman Bharat golden card? So that what you get to see is that if you are confronted with a disease, at least you are not stable biologically, but you may be stable financially to cater to the hospital charge. You know, it has become identity. Each of us is uh, queuing up in lines to make cards. And why that is so? Because we don't know. Today it has co come up as in the form of COVID. Previously it was in the form of uh, H1N1. Maybe something will come up which we are not stable for. And I need to have at least the financial security to, to bear the expenses of hospitalization, et cetera. So preparedness towards emerging diseases. It also requires drug development. And then potentiate to chemotherapeutics. We find we are finding drug resistance. We are having compromising drug specificity, bioavailability, drug efficacy and attenuated side effects. You know, here I would like to take a story because Manzoor has already spoken of that. I'm like a storyteller. I, I love to take stories. In a way, finding that uh, a couple of decades before, when there was an asthmic attack, a person had no option but to take a tablet which will go into his body unnecessarily and visit different parts of the body, even had the side effects of lung, uh, this uh, liver accumulation and all that. And the time in which it will have the effect was no less than half an hour because the drug, the tablet has to go into the body and then distribute. And with the discovery of aerosol technology and the inhalers and other things, today you find that asthmic attacks can be even controlled in less than five minutes time with the puffing or inhaling or even with the nebulization type of thing. So we say drug efficacy is one of the very important things for the development of drugs as well. So cutting the long story short, we say that the drug development is an evergreen interest of synthetic medicinal, chemist, and pharmaceutical scientists. So for these reasons that I try to speak about, is one of the reasons why we are finding a topic like drug development. There. If you look quickly for the methods of drug development, what they have? We start from older days like Aushadi, 
you know, some centuries before medicines were the tools of a spiritual person or a saintly person. He will give something and it will be taken as a drug and the disease will be, so then started folk medicine. Then combinatorial libraries, people will make enough number of compounds and then pick up something. Natural product extracts, structure activity response relationship, bioisosterism, in which chemical moieties, which have similar physical and chemical properties, are considered to be having drug-like activity. Even random screening for leads, which still continues to be in the medicinal chemistry groups. So if there are these methods of drug development, aren't they spice enough? What's the problem with them? These approaches suffer limitations. And what are the limitations? They are of more general nature. They are time consuming. You cannot rely them for their fastness. They are less specific. They are, the drugs that are produced from these methods have low drug efficacy. Their mechanisms are poorly understood most of the time. And sometimes they have compromising pharmacokinetics. I mean, they are not quickly. Like people say about Ayurvedic medicines, or yes, Koshi uh, we can't speak in Kashmiri because we have an audience across the country. So in our local language, we say, okay, if it will not cure you, it will not harm you, or it may cure you over a decade, or it may cure you over 10 days. So that's not possible. Abitsar and other people who are little, uh, you can say, aware of the things, we say that people have not only lost patience with other things, they have also lost patience with a disease. You know? If they get a disease today, they want the drug to be working in minutes time. You know, older days, people say, I'm ill, I'll take the rest for two, three days and it would be gone. Today you say, I got a disease, uh, pump in the injection so that it's over in five minutes. So patient's loss is there as well. So with these methods of drug development, what do we currently have? So contemporary approaches. That's why my message is for the first thing of this talk. The contemporary approaches, that means what we are finding current methods of drug development, they focus on the target synthesis. They, with the green and other things at work, we can't look for combinatorial combinations. We work on target synthesis of designed molecules for identified physiological targets for the time and cost effective development of drugs. So we only want to make the molecules which have the potence to be the drugs. Now, this is what is a very million dollar question. How to select compounds as possible drugs? This is a second part of our today's presentation or talk. You know, people say that how to select a drug is like selecting a research problem. You don't know where it will go or how good it can be. It can be a problem for a Nobel Prize or it can be a problem for an unpublished result. So as a concept, we can say to guess the drug potential of a compound. What do we need to know? We need to know three things. We need to know that what is the target for which you are considering this as a drug? So older days, we can consider the same compound to be drug for anything. But in today's time, we cannot afford to do that. We first have to identify the target and see if we have a target and we need a drug for that target. So we need to know about the target we are seeking the drug for. Not only that, we should know the physiological mechanism behind the ailment. That means we should know that if this disease or problem, what's the physiological mechanism behind this problem? What is the target involved? So once we know the mechanism and we know the target, we can guess what type of compound can be the potential candidate to be taken as drug. I will elaborate on this with some case studies later. So apart from this concept, the things that are desirable properties for a compound to be called as drugs, I repeat, these are desirable. These are not essential. They are desirable. They help increase the efficacy of drug. Low molecular weight. A balanced hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity. It was a very interesting concept. Earlier people would say that hydrophobicity is a problem, but today currently we say no, hydrophobicity is some solution sometimes. So it's not only hydrophilicity that it can have mobility. What else we should have? We should have a balance of hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity. 
stability under physiological conditions. We know that once a drug is taken in the body or administered in the body, before reaching to the target, it passes through different uh, you know, mechanisms, phenomena, et cetera, and it should be stable under such physiological conditions. And one very important thing, drug is a foreign entity. And once we introduce it in our body, it's liable for metabolic transformation. And if a compound, which we consider under in vitro conditions is a drug, it may not essentially mean that the same compound can be drug under biological conditions or physiological conditions also, because it may get metabolized. And if it gets metabolized, it may lose its drug action or it may change to something more toxic. So we have to take care that the compound we are expecting to be a drug, it either should not get a metabolic transformation. If it gets a metabolic transformation, it should not transform to something so that it loses its drug action, or it should not metabolize to some of the toxic forms. Instead, there's a concept like prodrugs. Prodrugs are something which are administered in the body and they are metabolically transformed to active drugs. So we should focus on something which are transformed to a better action by virtue of metabolic processes. It should not have a bioaccumulation. You know, steroids, et cetera, they have such problems. And it should have minimum toxicity possible under therapeutic concentrations. You know, we can't give complete intoxicity to any substance. Every substance, even people say water is toxic beyond certain concentration. But it should not be toxic under therapeutic concentration. And I add one more thing is it should have an acceptable pharmacokinetics. That means it should have a reasonably faster time scale of action. So these are the desirabilities. Now, what I have to say out of this, why did we focus? What I want you to appreciate and understand also is this topic, supra interactions and drug propensity. We, nature has been very kind. You know, especially the drug targets, which are in the form of proteins, or which are in the form of enzymes, or even receptors, they represent soft dynamic systems. So biotargets, especially proteins and enzymes, are soft systems. If, if, if we focus on the basic biology of a protein, or an enzyme, what do we see? That the functional part is basically the tertiary or quaternary structure of this protein. The primary structure is a polypeptide chain, which has been formed by a covalent peptide bonds. The secondary structure also involves some covalent linkages like disulfide bonds, etc. But the tertiary and quaternary structures, which give the functional role to the protein, they are formed of non-covalent interactions like hydrogen bonding, ion dipole, hydrophobic interactions, cation exchanges, uh, interactions, and so on and so forth. That means the functional structure, if this is the functional structure of your protein, it's not reached, it's dynamic, because it has formed, it's been formed by virtue of flexible non-covalent interactions. And that is where we say our target is ready for manipulation or modulation. This is nature's you know, advantage on us that the nature has been kind to us in such a way that it has allowed modulation. Abid sir and other people will bear me out in, in, in saying this common saying that God has first created the medicine and then introduced the disease. Why is that scope? The scope is in this modulation. So what we are saying, biotargets, especially proteins and enzymes, are soft systems. Their active structures are dynamic and tunable. Had they not been this dynamic and tunable, we would say that we have no option to have the drugs because the targets are reached. They are not flexible to change. But because of their dynamic nature, we can tune them. And if I'm using the hands to give a impression about what it is and what I want to convey in a very precise manner. Now, imagine your disease is like a changed wheel alignment of your car. This is the functional part. 
and maybe this is the bad part or the ailment part or the disease part. This was the normal configuration or the confirmation, and this is the change. Now you want to get it back. And there you have learned in, in your early day biology called, there are two mechanisms for interaction of a compound with the target. One called lock and key, which means there are predefined configurations of matching. And there is another one called induce a fit, in which this particular uh, compound as a drug can induce some changes by which it can get itself fitted into it. And this induced fit type of process has a potential to modulate physiological function. For example, if this is a changed or altered confirmation and you introduce something which is capable of interacting with it and it can correct it back to the origin, it means you have controlled the ailment because it was liable to change. The very famous Bollywood song goes in way of saying, Asman zameen pe aayega lane wala chahiye. And same type of thing applies here too. If you have a molecule which is good enough as a drug entity that it can induce your desirable change, it means it can do wonders and it can do essential things which we want here. And that's why we say supra interactions work. Why? Because the things that are happening here are via non covalent interaction. And our basic thermodynamics says that if it's in a conformation by virtue of some interactions and you give a thermodynamically more stronger interactions possible by means of a drug entity, what will happen? It will twist and change in search of these extra or stabilizing thermodynamic interactions. It's capable of changing or transforming it from its bad situation, just like when your wheels of car are getting what we call as, uh, they lose their alignment but you get them tightened back and they are ready to work. Same thing happens here when we say supra interactions and drug propensity. How supra interactions play a role in drug propensity? We can say introduction of supra type functionalities are capable of inducing non covalent interactions with bio targets, potential drug binding sites in a molecule. More the number of such supra sites in a molecule, higher is the chance of interaction and more likely the compound can be a potent drug candidate. So how to answer this question, how to select a compound as a possible drug moiety, we have to see that we have to introduce more type of these supra functionalities. What are they? They are not something very out of this world. They are like a hydroxyl group. They are like an aromatic side chain. They are like a uh, uh, halogen atom, or they are like something which is capable of developing non-covalent interactions like hydrogen bonding, pi pi staking interactions, ion dipole type of interactions, or even what we call as uh, the very uh, recently explored halogen bonding. So supra functionalities is a way forward in the selection of selecting target oriented drug compounds. Next, to make the long story short, we'll be having a sort of what we call as this sort of picture in which we say there can be enough biological targets. There's no doubt about how many biological targets can be there. There can be so many, but let us focus on those targets which are having some physiological connection. And it's a handful of them because I'm going to speak about these. That's why I've selected. There are so many other targets. Please try to understand. If you have a bio target in the form of serum albumins, which include HSA, BSA, et cetera, what is the pharmacological connection? What is the role of this bio target? The role is it gives bioavailability, biocompatibility. This is one of the very important things. You know, I'm not talking about this right now because that will overstretch. And a physiological stability of bioactive compounds. Because you have heard of something called lysosomal activities and blah, blah, blah type of thing. Once a bad or foreign entity gets in the body, body evades it. So when it binds to these albumins, it's considered to be a biologically viable form. It may not be acted upon by cellular machinery. It has a mobility to be moved. So for this pharmacological connection, if I want to make a drug molecule, what is its demand? The demand is it should have good binding as well as release kinetics. So if I want a drug which has a target of albumins, it should bind it 
so that it can acquire bioavailability, compatibility, and physiological stability. But at the same time, it should have a good release kinetics so that once it's at its active site, it's capable of releasing from the compound or from the protein for its action. Similarly, if we talk of DNA as a target, we have cytotoxicity, we have cancer, and we have the mechanism of cancer apoptosis. And what is the drug demand for this particular target? The drug demand is it should be binding and it should cleave DNA at a very lower concentration. If we have a target like catalase, its pharmacological connection is oxidative stress and related diseases. And what is the drug demand? If I want a drug for catalase, what it should be capable of? It should be capable of catalase activity promotion. It should increase the catalase activity. If we change the target to acetylcholine stress, another protein or enzyme, its pharmacological connection is it gives neurodegenerative diseases. And what is the desired drug demand? What your compound should do for a style choline stress? It should inhibit its activity so that the physiological condition is better. So these are the common targets. As I said, that these are not only targets, but some of the targets. And here's a glimpse about something which is very interesting and at the same time, a challenging situation. This is what do the books say? This is the active site of a catalase enzyme. This is what the book says, that it has something like here, called as an active site, the function happens here, and then it has been. This is what does the crystallographer say, that, oh, it's the active site, but it's in the form of a tetrameric structure. And this is what a drug compound or a medicinal or a pharmacological chemist sees. It's the same compound with the actual biostructure in which it is clubbed by lots of water molecules. So had the picture been like this, it was like that you can pick up the molecule and place it on the active site. It is so open. But the severity is you go in the retrospect. This is what does your book says. This is what does the crystallographer say? No, it's not one unit, it's four unit and the complexity increases. And this is what actually it is physiologically. So your drug has not to go to this site. Your drug has not to go to this. Your drug has to find its way in this particular form to reach to the active site. And it should be in your mind when we are targeting, we are not targeting this the way it looks. We are targeting something this. There's a fantastic paper which uh, should be read uh, about a style choline stress. I hope uh, you are in a position to see this reference. It's a paper in chemical biological interactions for the year 2018, how structure is related to function with respect to a style core industry. A very interesting read paper. Then, quickly coming to the third part of what we are doing today. So what did we deal till now? We identified what's the importance of having a drug, number one. Why do we need new drugs? Number two, which molecules are capable of being drug-like, which we can select to be drugs? How supra interactions help the drug action? And then what are the common targets? If I just go back for a second, you have to bear this thing in mind, especially students for the professors and faculty, I'm sorry, they will be finding it very trivial, but for the students, because I'm told that's a mixed audience bulk of the students are there also. So, we need to know what the things have to be done with the targets. What target requires what type of drug demand? And then the third part, which makes the body of today's lecture. That is analytical monitoring of drug target interaction. It's, it's so many classes, it's so many lectures to elaborate upon this. But one thing, life is easy in science in one way to the young scientists and other people I would like to mention. There are established models. There are available softwares. Today's science is more structured than the older day science in which you have to do everything by yourself. With collaborations, with the instrumental, you can say approaches, we can approach a problem effectively, 
in a shorter period of time. So what I'm going to talk about analytical monitoring methods, they are those methods which are accessible, even at IUST, I'm sure. And I'm not going to take you to those methods which are super extra smart and very sophisticated. In the morning session, you have heard Professor Riyazuddin sir for ICT. And ICT is one of the fantastic things to quantify drug target interaction. But I'll not be talking about such methods. I'll be talking about simple methods so that you are confident that this work is possible at any of the places you are, even in the college. Manzoor has given me a little advantage of saying that I stretch and I want to stretch so that the message is conveyed. Why analytical monitoring is important? Analytical monitoring is important first to know whether there is an interaction or not. And if there is an interaction, what is the scale of interaction? Is it interacting for no practical purpose or it's interacting with a very good efficacy? And what is an outcome of this interaction? Is this just an interaction or something is happening out of it? So whole of it, so we say, after selecting the molecule, I'll, I'll give some example later. I'll, I don't want to stretch it before. After selecting a molecule which has the potential to be developed as drug, it's very, very essential that we have a monitoring system in place to see whether it's doing as per our choice or not. Because if we don't have a monitoring system, we may be presumptuous or we may be like hypothesizing. Yeah, oh, my compound is wonderful. It's going to have a fantastic drug action. But you need to see whether it's having or not. So how do you guess that? You guess that with analytical monitoring. So what are the common methods of drug target interaction? I've given the title so that the things are more you know, clear and conveyable. The common methods of drug target interaction can be summarized into three categories. A, biophysical methods, in silico methods, and molecular biology methods. And each method has its fear advantage and a serious role. When we want to quantify and qualitative and quantitative picture of drug target interaction can be had from biophysical methods, which include absorbance, fluorescence, both of them are available at IUST and most of the universities and even colleges. And lately, circular dichroism for some special thing. So what do the biophysical methods do? They help to qualitatively and quantitatively identify whether there is a drug target interaction or not then they cannot tell you about the mechanistic insights. Of course, they can do to some level, but not to the level. In silico methods are very smart. I very often tell Manzoor in our meetings at NCL that in silico has the capacity to virtually see the world and especially the bio world. And that virtualness is now getting very close to the reality with the development of extra theories and uh, Mudit and other people will also be more uh, you know, aware of the thing, that once the theory is getting more and more refined, we are getting results from in silico, which are close to the reality. So in in silico methods, we have molecular docking and simulation. Molecular docking is something like static, but when we need to know a dynamic world, we can't do it in a static way. We have to do it in a dynamic way. And simulations see the world the bio world in a dynamic way. I'll, I'll let you know later with some examples. So with the first, you found the interaction, you quantify the interaction. With the second, you got the mechanistic insight. Now, both of them are important, but what is more important to see whether this interaction is translated into a physiological function. Is this interaction good enough to have a physiological response? Is this interaction good enough to have an effect? To check the effect, 
we have mo molecular biology methods which start from MTT, that's a cell viability assay, and then electrophoresis. And for the mechanism, we have Western blotting. So to know the drug target interaction, this is the sequence of methods we follow. We start from biophysical, we go to the mechanistic insights from in silico, and we see the physiological responses through molecular biology methods. Okay. To the students, not to the audience who are already accomplished researchers, and something very, very interesting to let know the students. You young people, you be encouraged to do the science. Don't fear it. Because there are many things which are helping your understanding and observations. The only thing is you should come across a good teacher in your studies that will let you know there are something called descriptors. Har ek cheez ka ek descriptor hai. Jaise aapko bukhar hai ya nahi hai, Temperature is a descriptor. Aap, har ek cheez, whatever you possibly think of, it has a descriptor. And if we know the descriptor and we know the values, you know, I, I can give an example. As a teacher, I'm, I'm helpless. I'll give an example. That people get to see their biochemical reports, tests, sometimes themselves by looking at the reference range, don't they? They do a physiological test or they do a biological or a pathological test like for cholesterol. And they say, oh, my levels are 140. Had they not had the referral range, were they in a position to tell whether I am low or high on cholesterol? No, what do they do is, they see the descriptor value. kitna chahiye, aur mera kitna hai. So they come to a conclusion. Kabhi kabhi wo self doctors bhi bante. Hey, zyada hai, dawai khani chahiye. You get my point? How that becomes possible? That becomes possible once you have a descriptor. So descriptors make the life in analytical chemistry very, very easy when you have the referral values. So if we talk of visible absorption method, how visible absorption method as an analytical method gives information about drug target interaction? My dear people, I made it easy for you. An intensity change of absorbance during drug target titration. Titration is something when you add in a continuous amount to the drug. So there can be intensity changes, and there are of two types, hyperchromic and hypochromic shifts. If there are no changes whatsoever, you say there are no interactions. But if there are changes, it means there are interactions. So what can be the changes? It can be hyperchromic, hypochromic. They can be wavelength shifts like bathochromic and blue shifts. They can be emergence of new bands pertinent to drug compound interaction. Absorption also helps to know enzyme kinetics. And in kinetics, there can be promotion or inhibition. So these are the things absorptive methods help to qualitatively and quantitatively identify drug target interaction. What do we get from these? What are the applications? We get to know whether the drug is binding the target or not. We get to know what are the relative strengths. You know, if your compound is binding, but it's not binding of a good strength, you say it's not very useful. If it's binding with a possible change in structure or not, you know, there are some descriptors which will tell you whether it's a simple binding or binding with a change of structure. It can tell you about thermodynamics of binding, called binding constants and energies. It can help you to know about thermal denaturations. I'll let you know what it is. That is it totally you know, disrupting the th structure of the compound called denaturation. That means it has lost its complete biological function. One of the ways in which it can be done is like a fantastic wolf schumer equation, which is used to calculate KB values. There are softwares to do it. Don't worry much about the mathematics. It will fall in line. The only thing is you need to know the concept. There's a little interesting paper in Croatia from our group on that. Then the another method is fluorescence method. What happens in fluorescence method? If we do fluorescence intensity studies, we get hyperchromic and hypochromic effects are we? We get wavelength shifts. We get new fluorescence patterns. There's a famous thing called Stern-Wormel analysis, 
and site marker assays. Now, fluorescence is little smarter than absorption in getting a site marker assay. We can with confidence say why the compound is binding. And what are the applications again? Whether the drug is binding the target or not? What are the relative strengths? Whether the binding is with a change? Again, the thermodynamics using stern volmer constants and Arrhenius equation. Number of binding sites on a target. Is this binding only at one site or more than one site? And this eighth one, eighth one is one of the fantastic things. It can also give you an idea about what are the major forces involved. That's one of the important things. And these are some of the defining equations which you find. And again, I tell you that Excel sheets are available. So many things are available. Don't be frightened by it. Just know what they can do. As an illustration, let me take you to one important thing called site marking assays. You know, to bind is to determine whether it's binding or not, it's very easy. But the effect is not same if it binds at any point. My dear people, when I take PhD students, I tell them about a story from on this example. See, think of a problem that commonly happens in Indian villages or in at our place only. A cow gets to get into a well. A cow falls in a well. So you want to dig that cow out. You know? Is it easy? No, it's very difficult because cow is scared. Cow does not cooperate. Then you tie a rope on the cow to dig it out. But tying a rope on cow at any point, will it have the same effect? Imagine you tie the rope or you make the knot on the horn of cow. What will happen? As you pull it out, will the knot remain or it will be broken? It could be broken. Will you tie the knot at the tail of cow? Again, it will not be very superior. And there is a chance if you tie a knot around the throat of the cow and try to pull it out, the cow may cow out, come out, but it would be a dead cow because you have suffocated cow to death. There's only one point where you can tie the knot around the cow and safely get the cow out, that is around its belly. Similarly, when, when it comes to bind to a marker or to a target, while it's binding, it's very important for its physiological action. Take an example of a DNA strand, for example. It can bind in between, you call it as an intercalator. It can bind over a groove called as a major groove. It can bind with an external contact called an external binder. It can bind in a minor groove or it can be a disintercalator. You are PG students reasonable enough to say that every binding cannot have the same effect. And now if your compound is binding, it's very imperative on us to know why it's it binding. And to know why it's binding and why, why it's imperative on us to know why it's binding because every binding will not have the same effect. And if we want a pronounced effect, we have to prompt some special binding site. Ethereum bromide, DAPI, and methyl green. They are among the few strain, stains which selectively bind DNA at some point. For example, ethereum bromide is an intercalator. It binds in, in between the nitrogen bases. Now, if your compound is binding at the same point, it's giving you competitive binding. And what will happen? It will replace. Something like this will happen. A competitive binder will bind and it will replace ethidium bromide, and there would be a decrease in fluorescence. Similarly, DAPI, it will bind in a minor groove. If your compound is binding in the minor groove, it will do a competitive fluorescence with that of DAPI and it will replace DAPI. If it's binding in a major groove, it will replace methyl green. So these competitive fluorescence assays, they are called site marking. Because what do they do is that they, depending on the compound, if it competes with ethidium bromide, it's an intercalator. If it competes with DAPI, it's a minor group binder. If it creates, uh, competes with methyl green, it's a major group binder. Same is that of DSA. We have a ibrofin and we have warfarin as the site markers. 
And when we calculate, see in the table, when we calculate the binding constant, when there was blank, when there was no site marker, the compound had a binding constant of 12. But as you said, ibrofen to it. So if the compound and the ibrofen are competing for the same site, you say that the binding has gone competitive and there's a decrease. And if it's binding to the warfarin site, there should be more decrease. So what we see that harmol is, for example, a compound. If it's binding without competitiveness, it's having a binding constant of 12. But when it binds with a competitor like ibrofen, it gets 10. And when, when it binds with a competitor with warfarin, it gets six. So which is a stronger competitor? You say warfarin is a stronger competitor. It means, nevertheless, harmol is binding BSA at the same point where warfarin is binding. And warfarin is binding at site one, which is the recognized site in its crystal structure. So since it's binding at the site one, it means the compound is also preferentially binding at the site one because it's keeping a higher competitiveness with that of warfarin. Then, this binding, etc., is only trivial unless and until it gets translated into the action. And what is the action? The action is when it changes the enzyme kinetics. Enzyme kinetics change is of two types, promotion and inhibition. Promotion is very easy. There's a decrease uh, in KM values. But inhibition is of multi-types. It can be competitive, it can be uncompetitive, it can be non-competitive, it can be mixed. I'm sure all of these cases you might be having an idea about. But see, I have given the case in the middle and I have seen the changes in the graph. This is the line we were bulk plot and this is the corresponding normal enzyme kinetics plot. You see the shapes of the plots are changing. With these plots, you can guess what's the type of inhibition. And one would wonder why I need to know the type of inhibition because again, the effect or the physiologically relevant effect is not same under every sort of inhibition. I have found this very interesting table in the internet, which gives some of the descriptors to differentiate the inhibition mechanisms. If it is competitive, your Vmax does not change, your KM increases this. And with this type of response, you have to run an experiment and see what is your data? Is it fitting a situation A, B, C, or D? You can let to know what type of inhibition your compound is. And with a mixed inhibition, you have sometimes better response than the other. Sometimes, I use the word with caution, not all the times. Then, my target was to reach it to it in the first hour, and I'm happy your faces are not very gloomy in a way of finding that I have overstretched. So normally take home message or the learning outcomes are given at the last. I'm doing little differently because before I go to the work I have performed in this particular area or our group has performed in this particular area, it would be very important because students get lost, you know, in a virtual mode, keeping sticking to your computer or whatever thing you are writing for. Although in your Android phone, you have an eye comfort option. Please use it when you are on workshop so that your eyes don't get tired. And eyes get tired, your brain gets tired and all the signs goes away. So I've taken learning outcomes to wake up the people who have enjoyed a nap in between so that uh, they find that what we have spoken till now and they become fresh to see what we have done in the next phase if it's allowed by the people. So learning outcomes or take home message. What is the minimum thing for which you bore me for the next, not bore actually, you bored, B-O-A-R-D. You had the patience to hear me for the last one hour is for this thing. And I forgot to take up the joke, which I should have said at the first, when I mean drug, I mean a pharmaceutical formulation. I don't mean a thing of spy, you know? Drug is synonymous, so there's a drug abuse as a word. So what I have been spoken about of a drug, it is basically a pharmaceutical formulation, not something different. So what are the learning outcomes or take home message? 
bioactive motifs motif means something as a structural unit when they are decorated i have borrowed the word decoration from mudit he has written a nice paper with the word decoration decorated with supramolecular functionalities it can have tailored pharmacological properties for targeted physiological response this this can lead to a selective chemotherapeutic effect so that means we have to select a bioactive motif and add to it supra functionalities to make good drugs what do supra functionalities do please take up this line very effectively supra functionalities are handles of the interaction they are the handles like you have a car handle they are the handles of the interaction between the drug and the biological target tuning these can modulate the bio, bio targets for their relevant physiological response so if you want a relevant physiological response you should select the good functionalities promotion as well as inhibition can be both important but for appropriate bio targets for a desired pharmacological need you don't only look for an increase in the activity remember for catalase you require an increase but for estoyl cholinesterase you require a decrease so promotion as well as inhibition both are important but you need to know what systems require promotion and what systems require inhibition biological domain is soft dynamic and ready for modulation so it's the hope selecting a modulator is a tricky you know i say that being a modulator is always tricky similarly selecting a modulator is tricky but manageable problem that means we can make use of chemistry concepts even supra concepts to handle it analytical methods serve as models to correlate quantify and compare the compound bio target interactions for a meaningful design in silico methods of docking and simulations give a virtual insight in the biological phenomena behind compound target interaction for a mechanistic insight imagine your studies have no relevance your studies have no effectiveness unless and until you have the in silico backing of your mechanism of this is the most important thing which i want you to appreciate and bear in mind a chemical biological interaction you know every paper does not go to jscs every paper does not go big why what's the problem a chemical biological interaction is viable it's useful only when it can be translated in a desired physiological response you know millions of the compounds have found cytotoxic activity millions but cisplatin is still being used because the physiological response is more important so these interactions have no meaning unless and until they can be translated in a physiological response generating leads for selected targets can significantly reduce time now this is what we are currently using for drug development we have not to identify the lead identify the lead will take a longer time we have to settle down on paper and design so which we call as generating lead for selected target it will significantly reduce time for the development of new drugs than identifying leads via combinatorial approaches so these are some of the statements which are worth to carry forward as a learning outcomes okay this is the last segment of our presentation which uh, is the representative case studies from our work what we have done in this direction especially in supra yes we'll take the answers mushtaq wait a minute we'll take the answers later so i'll just give the story of these papers i'll not talk about intricate details luckily everything is published so for all the interesting details about how do they do it and all that sort of things you can find them but i'll just state them in a very interesting way so that it's not boring to the audience providing extra detail this is our first example of supra decorated thiazolidone 4 carboxylic acid for enhanced catalase activity what did we do in this this is a thiazolidone carboxylic acid motif 
we did not synthesize this not at all one thing is very important once you do chemical bio interactions it's important that you have the crystal structure of the compound for so many reasons so we went in ccdc search and we find what are the available compounds which have these supra functionalities over this motif we find these many and luckily this compound was having that there's a term called supra score so what's the supra score of a compound so this compound which is encircled we have produced it as a part of a separate work in a journal of sulfur chemistry we have synthesized this compound and reported synthesis and crystal structure we did not synthesize any of them we only went down a search and find which of these molecules has the highest supra score and we find this compound has the highest supra score and with that highest supra score we were also lucky that it was available with us as a sample because we had already synthesized it so how how the things proceed that the first thing that you need to do is to see what we call as electrostatic potential map of this compound people in computational business they know it to see what is the charge separation over this molecule so you see that in this compound has a fairly good charge separation we have the regions in space all over where there is some charge then second important thing is to see what is the homo lumo energy separation and what is the homo lumo look like so in this case it looks like a pi to pi star transition so that means excited state is more charge is separated which means it's capable of doing more interactions than the ground state when we took at this molecule and identify what are the supra sites in it we find there can be a donor site hydrogen donor site there is a hydrophobic site there is an electrostatic site another hydrophobic site acceptor site so so many sites and what we do with this compound so we followed the protocol and we went systematic in case of target studies the first thing to do is we first start with bsa that's a serum albumin because if a compound can bind to bsa it gives a chit that it can bind to other proteins as well because the structure of most of the proteins not the total structure but the bulk structure it resembles in its chemical form there are same amino acids only the sequencing and other things match so we find we did the biophysical interactions and we find absorption emission plots i don't want to take you there but what did you find absorption changes there are hyperchromic effects and when we did the thermodynamics we find a is for bsa b is for catalase it binds to both and it binds with a higher thermodynamic binding constant to catalase and when we did the temperature studies we find even very interesting things that ksv values decrease with temperature which means a static quenching and when we did in silico part we find it binds on bsa over this side and on catalase which is our main thing away from the active site but at an allosteric site we get to know this is an allosteric site from the simulations later it's called leak plot and in this leak plot what do we see we see what are the amino acids which are guarding the binding pocket we find they are guarding the binding pocket in a very nice way and i want to sorry i want to sort of get you to something here which i am sure i am not seeing but maybe you are seeing here there the quantification of supra factors how much of electrostatic they are color coded basically it's an electrostatic and so on and so forth i i may have the data so this is important as part of thermodynamics is concerned so we find that the binding of pz t to bsa as well as this it's exothermic and entropy favorable and how did it become entropy favorable one of the assumptions which was matching with our data and the literature is that it increases hydrophobicity around tryptophan residues with which if you see the earlier day, earlier structure somewhere here there's a plenty of water molecules 
which are a part of this catalase. So once the hydrophobicity increases at a point, you get a junk of water molecules to be lost from it. We call it as a compactness of the protein. And with that loss of water molecules, it adds up to what we call as entropy favor. Quenching was seen to be static, and we had an entropic and enthalpic advantage. And there's a very famous article by Ross and Subramaniam, which correlates the delta H and delta S changes with a sort of type of interactions. And we could find that the interactions that are taking place, they are bulk hydrogen bonding and mostly hydrogen bonding and hydrophobic from the aromatic sites and so on and so forth. I'm being fast so that I want to finish it. Now, is this binding not only thermodynamically favorable and other other things, it's also hinting that there's a change in the structure. Now, whether that change of structure is there or not, so we went to circular dichroism. And we identified, yes, with the increase in the concentration, there's a change in the structure. And thanks to this software, K2D3, which allows your online data to be analyzed right at the instrument only. And it gives you the change in the protein in terms of what happens to alpha helix part, to the beta helix part, and the random coils. And we see that the alpha helix part is increasing with an increase in the concentration. And beta sheet is diminishing, and alpha coil is also. So actually what we are seeing, we are seeing that the effect is like that your catalase after binding to this compound is opening up at a point which is like helix change. You know, If you have sheet, it's something like this. And when you have a helix, it becomes like this. A helix is a more open structure than the sheet. The sheet is more compact and helix is more open. So binding of TZT has introduced two things in this protein. Number one, it has made it more compact. It has added to the integrity of protein. It has removed the water from it. And the interactions are stabling, stabilizing. And at the same time, in some region, it has increased the helicity. And to our good luck, this helicity increase has happened in the substrate channel. Now you can say that the opening up of this is like a morning flower and the substrate channel has increased or opened up with which the excess of your substrate, hydrogen peroxide, which is a substrate for catalase, has increased to the active site. So once there's the more or easy flow of substrate to the active site, it will increase in its catalytic performance. So this is the main interaction which is involved. And one more important thing is, which we have done from simulations, that there are four chains of this protein. And these chains, I have not taken that data because that would be too much. It will take more elaboration. But what's the long story short? The four chains are involved. That means the structure that is changing is not only changing one segment. Catalase is a tetramer. It's a four unit enzyme. And the change is happening over all the four units. But the magnitude of change is higher on A and C. And A and C chains are basically you know, your entry sites. And with which you say 63% of the total energy comes from non-covalent interaction. The first thought, you increase the supra interactions, you get the effect. So you say 63% is why our covalent interactions on. Now, is this capable of translating? We find it's binding. It's binding to change the structure. Now, is the change of structure having a catalytic response? The answer is yes. TZT binding enhances the catalase activity via an allosteric effect. So it's a line weaver bug plot, but let us focus here. As we increase the micromolar concentration of TZT, we find that the KM values are decreasing. The substrate affinity is increasing. And KCAT values, which basically means the catalytic performance, they are also increasing. Not only catalytic performance is increasing, there's a term called catalytic efficiency, which actually means how good it is now to find the higher concentration. Is it getting poisoned, et cetera? No, 
it's getting catalytic efficiency is also increasing at higher concentrations of PZT. And one of the main reasons is a structural change and opening up of the structure substrate that's technically called bottleneck. The bottleneck has been removed. Now, is this change of any physiological relevance? Does anything happen by this change? The answer is yes. So TZT overcomes the oxidative stress induced cell proliferation. Again, it's uh, the third part. So this is the enzymatic part. This is the physiological part in which when the cells were treated with a very high concentration of TZT up to 1000 micromolar, they had really tolerance. They did not have much. You had even at 1000 micromolar, which is basically a millimolar concentration, you had some cells left. This may sound little you know, unusual to you that ascorbic acid is basically an antioxidant, but there's a, enough evidence. Yeah, sure, we will answer this up. There's an enough evidence by saying that when we increase the concentration of hydrogen peroxide, it triggers certain metabolic pathways by virtue of which there is a buildup of hydrogen peroxide. And with that buildup of hydrogen peroxide, what happens? The cells get oxidative stress. And we find the black curve here, it's a collaboration with biotechnologists. As the vitamin C concentration dosing to the cells was around 10 millimolar, there was a lot of cell viability loss. But when we added antioxidant in the form of curacetin, at a concentration of 100 micromolar, the blue one was maintained. So cell loss was controlled because the peroxide was controlled by curacetin. Under the same concentration, under the same situation, if we avoid curacetin and I, we use 30 micromolar of TZT, what happened? You get the same effect like that of curacetin. So curacetin is doing differently. It's preventing the damage, whereas TZT is enhancing the catalase activity and it's not allowing the buildup of catalase for the damage. And see comparatively, in one case, it was working at 100 micromolar concentration. And in case of TZT, it's already working at 30 micromolar concentration. So speaking of which is that it's not only, you know, binding, it's binding with the change and the change has an enzymatic response and that enzymatic response has a physiological relevance also. There's some literature for this thing and we got this paper luckily published in uh, physical chemistry, chemical physics because it had the bulk of biophysical experimentation although we wanted it to be published somewhere else but uh, it got uh, suitably published in physical chemistry, chemical physics for, for the biophysical content it had. I think, uh, Majid, uh, what to do at this point? We have two more case studies, one pertinent to DNA and one pertinent to, let's take, let, let's skip this DNA part. I think if you can quickly finish one of the, uh, I think, you know, one or two minutes, if you can finish that, then we can take some questions and we'll be having another lecture afterwards. Yeah, I know, I know. That's why I'm trying to be faster. Yeah. So let us, uh, let us uh, read the titles, you know. We can have a compound DNA target interactions we can design cytotoxic agents by that. We can monitor them, knowing the interactions, knowing the mechanism, knowing the methods, we can monitor them. Combining supramolecular again can help. This is a single molecule compound which had these desirable features. And when we did the biophysical investigations, we find that it's capable of rupturing the DNA at a very good, and this paper got published in European Journal of Medicinal Chemistry. It was a question for the people to find how do we guess cytotoxic propensity and the mechanism of DNA cleavage? Again, a very interesting, simple compound and a very effective response. And there was a chance of one mechanism, but it worked on a different mechanism, which was like a radical-based mechanism. And it got published in inorganic chemistry communication. Oh, this is something which is more interesting. As a part of out-of-box thinking, I would like to have a minute on this by saying, yeah, we will take the questions later. By saying one important thing, that is out-of-box thinking is very important. 
if there is a compound which is already registered as an effective drug, don't go by this thing that this is the last thing in it. There may be a compound which is more superior in action by virtue of its structure than that particular drug. The example is that of, uh, I work in selenium chemistry since some time. So it's an acetylcholine trace. This is the gorge or the gorge. These are the tunnels. And it has got three main important things. What you see here is basically the entry and exit called the main gorge. And then here you have a side door and here you have a back door and you have an allosteric site somewhere here. So that is the structure of this particular functional style choline space. And when it gets to work, we need to have drug which inhibits or lowers down its activity. Now what's next with it? We had already done the binding experiment of our, com uh, our compounds with BSA and catalase. So we did not work for the binding. We directly went for enzyme kinetics. These are the Michael Menten plots of a disalinide compound and an abiceline. Abiceline is basically the drug which is known to be effective in action. The disalinide you see, it has a very fantastic effect. Look at this profile. When we change from zero to one micromolar concentration, we had this much change in the enzymatic response. And same when we took it with the abyssalian, we had a very small change. It was more dose dependent in case of abyssalian. That means you are increasing the dose and you are getting the results accordingly. But here, there was a very sharp or an abrupt decrease in the enzymatic activity at a very smaller concentration. And it did not manipulate in a dose dependent manner. The line we were both plots are basically what we call as that of mixed inhibition. When we looked at the kinetic parameters, we find KM values drop drastically. You see, on the one micromolar addition, we had a change from 21 to 40, they increased, and Vmax dropped effectively. And in case of abyssalian, it was very small. When we went for the structural change, we find the structural change is opposite. It's a decrease with a blue shift. It's an increase with the red shift. Means the two are interacting in a protein with a protein in a different way. So I think we, uh, we can take the questions now. I know you have a lot to say. Okay, okay. So, so uh, this was to about uh, are... simulations, fine. Hmm. And uh, let me take it here for a minute. For the okay. summary sheet, okay. DPDSC, DPDSC had a stronger inhibition capability as compared to abyssalian via mixed inhibition, which means don't bother that there's a drug already. You can have a molecule which is better than the drug, provided the structure is so. Experimental measurements confirm the hydrophobicity in this case is more important because the mechanism that we were proposing is that this whole gorge it's guided by hydrophobic sites. So abyssalin is lower in action because it did not have a good hydrophobic site compared to disalina. Then comprehensive molecular simulations find there are many sites for binding to this compound than to the drug. So high taking and other things were more important. And we have found there's a side door entry the protein has a called a breathing movement. It takes the breath by taking the substrate and it expels the breath by giving the product. So this movement is what we call as breathing movement. And breathing movement has an exit point called gate. And what has happened, whatever compound has done, it has blocked the gate only. And it has not only stopped the flow of substrate to the active site, it has also prevented the exit of the product. This is a very interesting reading paper in the JPCB for 2021. And uh, all the interesting details can be had from there. So thank you very much. It was uh, very enlightening. Let's take the questions. Yes. Yes, Dr. Murthy, yeah. well, you, you want to ask something? I mean, you can ask only the specific questions. Other questions, you can WhatsApp the uh, Dr. Rizvisa, and he can uh, respond to every question. As he's available on the WhatsApp group, so you can ask the questions later on. But if there's a specific question related to the topic, 
Yeah, and if anybody wants to have this presentation for the uh, referencing, because I have not given the references at the end, they are in line. I'll be happy and glad to give it because all the work is published, so there's no problem about uh, giving the presentation. I, will I need this PPT. Oh, fine. Okay. Uh, oh. I'll give it to Marjit. Don't worry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mansoor, let's have the questions. What What's the question about? Okay, so uh, first question is basically from Mushtaq. He has yes. asked that supramolecular functionalities can sometimes uh, disfavor the effectiveness of drug. Yeah, it yeah. can metabolize easily while interacting with other physiological physiological counterparts. What true, is your true. say on this? Yeah, yeah, true. Both things are yes. possible. In fact, we, we tune it both ways. When we have to manipulate, say, in case of catalase, we have to increase the activity. And in case of estylcholinesterase, we have to decrease the activity. So there are pros and cons associated with everything. And supramolecular chemistry actually does both parts. So it's like that you have a CF3 group. CF3 group, you expect to introduce polarity when it introduces hydrophobicity because fluorine has a water repellency factor. So that way, agreed, Mushtaq, both ways it can be. But looking at the positive aspect, we say that it can be taken in a positive way. And if we uh, program the molecule in such a way that it does the action and we control that it is not metabolizing in a bad way, then uh, we can use it. If it's metabolizing in a bad way, then the chance is uh, less. Uh, agreed, no problem. Yes. Second. So uh, one more question is there, how are we able to identify a proper binding site and yeah, how yeah. change in entropy and change in enthalpy affects binding? Yeah, I'll be very happy in giving a very elaborate lecture on that, uh, if that is possible anytime, because we have we have, we have a couple of things to do it. First, we have something called site marker assays. So site marker assays are uh, specialized experiments which are run uh, to identify the sites then we can infer the sites. The second part is we can infer the sites. For example, uh, if, uh, every time when we take a spectra, we have a peak and this peak is ascribed to a particular uh, site. And whenever there's a change in that particular peak, we can say, okay, this site has changed. So apart from the site marker assays, we can also have the spectral changes like red shift, blue shift, and uh, some things like that. And most importantly, then we have in silico methods, especially molecular simulations, which are in a dynamic way telling us what are the binding sites. So it, it's quite possible and people are doing it. Yes. So we have one more question. How much effective are the computational softwares in simulating drug designs? And what about the choice of taking this field for our research work? Oh, that, that's for you to answer actually, Mansoor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say, I say uh, I, I'm personally very, very uh, fascinated by in silico world because uh, it gives you a virtual chance to see each other. You know, I can I can shake onto you like this right now when I'm not actually shaking, but you can see uh, me offering a hand towards you. We may not do a handshake in real, but we can see that uh, we, we were making a handshake. So same is like that of this virtual world. It's not, it's not Hello. real. Uh, it's not real, okay. but it's making us to see the real. So that is something like, you know, it's not like seeing Amitabh Bachchan in live. It's like seeing Amitabh Bachchan in picture. So, but okay. both, that was a nice explanation. Man. <laughs> both that way you are seeing Amitabh Okay, uh, Mazur, I think we can have, if anyone have a question, you can directly uh, put the question in WhatsApp group or we can have a, a chat group so that we can contact receive up and then uh, have the explanation for that. So uh, I'm thankful to uh, such a wonderful lecture from uh, Dr. Rizvi Saab. Thank and you I, now, I, now I believe that why Mansur Saab is so good at teaching because he has secured a lot of signals from uh, his guide. Thank you. And one, wonder, one wonderful thing I noticed across the lecture is that you are using so much of analogies to explain the thing. And that makes lecture more interesting for everyone, even uh, as, a, uh, as a teacher, as a participant who are in uh, PG, I think it was a wonderful lecture. You have explained everything from the drug designing, from selecting a target, that, because that is very important when you select the target. Yes. And then how uh, you identify the target and then hiccups that comes in between when you are uh, designing a drug and then how it makes you bio, that is the bioavailability of drug can be increased. And then uh, of course the detection of uh, the drugs. So it was overall, I can say it was a good lecture, a wonderful lecture. And very much, uh, again, I'm saying that is the lots of analogies that you put while explaining the things makes this lecture so wonderful. Thanks, Thank Lord. Much.
Uh, I had a challenge to keep people sticking and uh, myself keeping speaking for the one and a half hour and I hope I have not bored you much. And, uh, it was not at all. It was 100%, sir. It, it was entertaining to you as well. Thank you very much. Please prepare for the next lecture as uh, students have a resting time or the participants have the resting time in between. Mm. No, sir. No, sir. It is just set. Okay. We are starting the lecture. To, uh, sir, I just wanted to say that some of the participants have asked it for uh, the presentation to be shared. They, sure, uh, sure, sure. They shared uh, it on the group. They will uh, find uh, it out. Okay, fine. No problem. Oh, Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for the... Uh, Assalamu alaikum and uh, COVID salam. salam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul. Thanks a lot. Okay, okay. okay so uh, 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 we have the final uh, lecture uh, of this uh, uh, two-day national workshop on uh, modern tools and techniques in chemical sciences, which will be basically uh, uh, delivered by Professor Ashish Pal. He has joined... Uh, and uh, uh, let me briefly introduce uh, uh, Professor Paul uh, to the uh, participants. Uh, professor Paul is basically a professor at the, uh, uh, basically he's a, a professor at the, uh, working in the field of, uh, uh, he's a professor at the Institute of uh, Nanoscience and Technology, uh, uh, Mohali, Punjab. And his uh, main uh, research uh, focuses on the development of uh, supramolecular polymeric hydrogel based uh, biomaterials. He also uh, studies uh, uh, combi dynamic combinatorial uh, chemistry for self-healing and functional uh, nanomaterials. Uh, also, he, has, uh, uh, he is interested uh, in doing research on uh, multivalent recognition of our imaging and uh, diagnostic apl applications. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Ashish has done his PhD from ISC Bangalore. And after that, he did a, a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in the molecular science and technology uh, uh, and Hoven uh, uh, University of Technology, uh, Netherlands, uh, during 2009 to March, uh, sorry, 2012. Uh, afterwards, he also did another postdoc uh, in uh, uh, University of uh, Groningen, Netherlands. And then he joined it as an associate professor uh, uh, in the Chemical Biology Unit, Institute of Science, Science and Technology, Mohali, India. Uh, currently, he is a professor there, and uh, he has published more than 50 research papers in this field and is recognized uh, and is recognized as a, as, a uh, as an expert in his research field, which has won him many awards, uh, such as the Young Scientist uh, from ECOST. With this brief introduction, I would uh, uh, like to request. Uh, uh, Professor Ashish Pal uh, to kindly uh, share his presentation and deliver the lecture. Thanks. Sir. So a very good uh, afternoon to all of you. And I hope I'm audible. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. And first of all, I would like to thank you. Uh, thank uh, Dr. Dar for extending the uh, uh, invitation uh, along with uh, also Dr. Salla, uh, who is a convener for this uh, faculty development program. And uh, so today, and I, as I have been asked that I would be giving a uh, lecture on uh, HP separation technique like HPLC and mass spectrometry. And I think um, when I will take you through for next uh, one and a half hour or so, I think I would like you to be convinced that, you know, recently this mass spectrometry, this has really, uh, you know, uh, evolved as a very powerful technique uh, for many, many applications. So I think before we go there, let me just introduce briefly about our institute. So this is uh, the brand new institute you see building. Uh, this is Institute of Nanoscience and Technology, which is under Department of Science and Technology. And it's the only nanoscience institute in the entire country. And um, uh, this, what you see over here is, uh, this is the one is our auditorium, which where we just started our conference since yesterday. That is the first conference ever happened so it is, we have recently moved here and uh, 
now more or less everything is functional in a, in this brand new institute and uh, yeah so in this institute my research is driven by looking at um, so my lab name is uh, biomimetic materials so basically what we do in the in uh, uh, in our uh, wait a minute let me get this somewhere okay so what we do is that we look at nature and look at the materials which are present in nature and we try to understand how do they work and how we can mimic such uh, materials so suppose one of the very interesting thing is that you can see that you you look at the trees and you see that you know trees uh, if you actually cut the tree they would be definitely you know with time might have uh, uh, fungal infection or bacterial infection but tree has their own mechanism to heal the wound and they they do it by you know secreting some latex or, uh, or if you look at this chameleon they it actually you know changes its color by its muscle movement okay so there are very interesting things which are you know, prevalent in nature and um, one of the uh, many of the things which you will see in nature they are guided by the supramolecular chemistry the previous first uh, speaker was also mentioning about the you know the robustness of supramolecular chemistry they are driven by many non covalent interactions so these are some of the things we are interested in also we are uh, looking at uh, you know the fundamental understanding uh, of how you know from the primordial soup uh, we got this uh, you know the rna or dna or protein uh, you know, the amino acid precursor which eventually formed those important biomolecule they got entrapped and then it actually formed uh, protocells and how this self assembly phenomena occurs. So this is some of the prime importance I have been looking at uh, uh, last 10 years um, since my stint in Netherlands. And also another important thing I would like to mention is um, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, we are now understanding this fundamental principle. We are actually working on different kinds of peptide or polymer material and we are trying to look at how we can mimic let's say the tissue engineering uh, using many of this material as scaffold and one of the challenging thing is mimicking these you know this kind of uh, cardiac muscle cells which uh, through which you can actually develop uh, artificial organ for regenerative medicine so we are looking from a chemist point of view we are looking at it of course I cannot talk to you uh, in details regarding our um, work because today my aim is to talk to you regarding something else just to give you a glimpse before that so we are inspired by this protein folding as you see protein is nothing but you know the polymer of let's say amino acid it's a primary sequence of that it actually gets into this uh, native form of protein so we may what you do is that we make a synthetic polymer chain and using this kind of stimuli we try to mimic uh, forming such kind of you know uh, nano container which are called single chain uh, collapse uh, polymeric nanoparticle they are very uniform in size using this we actually uh, look at many drug delivery applications and many other things like using the simple phenomena of polymeric chain we, and we also see this photoresponsive chain collapse and that is reversible in nature. We can actually coat this polymer on surface and this surface will be a self-healed coating. Just like I said about the tree, that it's actually, if you cut it, it will have its own mechanism for the healing of the wound. Similarly, if we can coat this polymer on some, uh, let's say solar panel, uh, on the photovoltaic cell, if you can uh, put it over there and if you cut it, you can heal it and you can make the so photovoltaic cell uh, you know last for a longer time now when you talk about photovoltaic cell it's not uh, you know the silicon i'm not talking about i'm talking about next generation let's say perovskite cells and all which are probably uh, in uh, have some instability issues so these are some of the work with the polymer we do apart from that we also this is my main uh, focus is this peptide material so we are working on this field for you know almost like 15 years or so and we look at many of these fundamental application like how to control the self assembly or growth of the peptide nanofiber using uh, uh, some of this technique called self sorting or you know living supramolecular self assembly 
We also perform catalysis. So these are some of the representative publication we uh, have recently. And apart from that, as I was talking to you about tissue engineering, now peptide nanofiber, which is basically a supramolecular uh, nanofiber, we also try to couple that with polymer and make peptide polymer conjugates. And we are we look at many of the interesting uh, you know mineralization application or very of the important uh, you know hydrogel which are strain stiffening hydrogel, not a typical hydrogel which you get to see normally. Uh, so these are some of the things we are actually using for you know the uh, you know. Uh, uh, ECM mimicking application for tissue engineering and so. And recently, I have been also, you know, taking inspiration from, you know, making polymeric beds and which can actually have sustained release of agriculture and uh, that can go work in tandem with the local drip irrigation technology, which has been, let's say, um, uh, shown by many of the Israeli scientists. So, which are uh, very good um, uh, in country like India, where you also have significant water shortage and um, uh, you know desert-like conditions. So, these are some of the work which I do. Unfortunately, uh, today is not the day. Maybe some other time uh, I might uh, be interested in uh, you know talking to you on some of this topic. Okay, why doesn't it go? Yeah, looks like it's frozen. Ah, yeah, yeah. All right. So today I am supposed to give you uh, the talk to you about mass. Now, why this mass is important? This is, I mean, if you are in a chemistry department, of course, we all know that when you make a molecule, and uh, the first thing we do is that uh, we just go and uh, check an IR. That gives us a fair idea about the functional group. And then what we do is that we do two, two more techniques to confirm whether we have made the molecule or not. One is this NMR. So NMR, suppose this is uh, aceto, uh, acetaminophenone, uh, acetamin, uh, yeah. So this is paracetamol. And then uh, if you take the uh, NMR spectra of that, you actually get certain peaks, which you can uh, you know, assign for many of these protons, right? So, and but then we need to also check if we can get the molar mass that the molecular ion peak of this particular one, let's say over here, uh, something like that, 151. If it is 151, you said, yes, so that means my molecule is done. I have made that. So this is what is required. So you can see this is a typical NMR um, machine, which is like uh, uh, 400 megahertz uh, NMR spectra. And then these are some of the mass. This is from INST itself, some of the mass uh, spectra mass uh, spectrometer which is coupled with HPLC. So definitely if we have to understand mass spectrometry, one has to also know HPLC, that is uh, high pressure liquid chromatography. That is very important. So I don't know what is the problem with yeah it's time to take okay that's fine. All right. So so we need to know what is chromatography. And if we are talking about chromatography, so one of the thing which you probably, I think uh, um, or many of the college students who have uh, joined in this talk, they have probably uh, performed uh, TLC or column chromatography. And what is the underlying principle for column chromatography? So basically what you do in this is that um, you, you, uh, you do a TLC, right? And then you spot, mixture of compounds. And then what you do is that you elute with uh, some solvents. And when you do so, you see that uh, depending on the polarity of your compound and also the uh, solvent, eluent, you act different compounds actually moved to different distance. And you call that as retention factor, right? That much you know about TLC. And once you know that it is getting separated, what you do is that you then, uh, you pack silica gel over here and you put your a mixture of compound over here on the top of the column and you elute, right? And as you elute, what happens? And normally in typical cases, you pack with silica and uh, it's a normal phase chromatography. You, when you take solvent like hexane or mixture of hexane, ethyl acetate or DCM or DCM and methanol like that. One thing you note here, silica here, your packing materials that is silica is actually much more polar than the 
solvent which is in normal phase chromatography right so when you do so you see that first uh, the non polar compounds actually comes out first and then polar compounds slowly comes out right that is the way it happens and this is a typical you know the silica gel um, those particles they look like and what is the first impression you get over here for the, sil the silica particles you see they are very irregular in shape and the size okay and that is why what happens when you are passing through okay sometimes some of the com compound doesn't want to really elute so what you do you apply pressure and when you apply pressure then they come but then what happens there is also problem that many of the things come together okay and also there is also you see that different compounds are supposed to come in a band but then then this band mixing happens right so this is this is what we know about column chromatography and we always say that you know unless you do around uh, 10 20 columns you are not expert of column chromatography right so now but then that's not always possible when you are dealing with many of the polar compounds, right? And because uh, if you are doing normal phase polar comp uh, uh, normal phase, then it's very hard to get uh, the compounds out using normal phase column chromatography. So in HPLC, you can do normal phase uh, HPLC as well. But mostly, since we are dealing with the polar compounds, what we do is that we perform reverse phase. So first thing we change when we go for uh, column chromatography to HPLC is actually we uh, change, uh, you can see the, the silica uh, particles becomes much more regular and they have a particular spherical shape. Okay, that actually reduces eventually the band. Okay, that band broadening gets reduced. The more sharper you get, actually you get nice peaks. I'm coming to there. Okay, so these things are actually packed within this column. These are all actually typical HPLC columns. In over here, you these are things, uh, the silica gels are packed, not like, you know, what we pack uh, typically in uh, um, column chromatography. Now, another important thing is that if you are now in HPLC, if you are really using reverse phase chromatography for particularly for the polar compounds, so what you would want is that your silica gel particle will actually not have the bare silica gel, rather it will be encapped with C18 chain. Okay, it's a C18, uh, that's a stearic acid based chain. Mm, it will be actually anchored onto this silica. Then what will happen? So your packing material becomes rather hydrophobic, and your solvent or eluent, which you pass through this column, which are water or some miscible organic solvent like acetonitrile or methanol, that's what you run. So what you notice here in reverse phase chromatography, the first thing you note is that your packing material is actually less polar than the solvent first thing to note then what will happen if you are passing this uh, you know your mixture of compound through it then what will happen the polar compound will always come out first from the uh, you know the hplc column right so that is very clear now and this is a typical hplc you can see and uh, you can see you need a computer okay interface you need where you can monitor and you need to have uh, you know this is auto sampler where you can just tell okay this vial you want to inject so what your injection will come, it will take it up and then it will inject within this column. And as soon as the col from column, it will get separated, mixture of compound will get separated. And as and when it comes, um, normally in column chromatography, you always run TLC to check, right? But in HPLC, it will automatically do because you have a UV detector or some other kind of detector that will sense that something is coming and it is separated or not, right? So this is the basic principle of HPLC. And from there, if you can correlate now i i just want to take you you know from this level to much higher level so i want you to be on board with me all the time so i'm just going in your level so another important thing you do i mean i just wanted to tell you what happens when you're flowing the eluent through the hplc column what happens so then let's say uh, when you are uh, you you must have done uh, extraction right so what you do is that you take immiscible two solvents one is organic phase another one is aqueous phase right now if you have let's say two compounds one is actually this kind of you know sulfate salt mm, uh, or another one is this aromatic thing so this is polar this is non polar right so what if you take it and you shake it in your extraction funnel or separatory funnel what will happen this one will go in organic phase and this one will tend to go in the aqueous phase right Right. So, and you can actually find out what is the partition coefficient of each of these molecule uh, based on 
the, an the analyte constant, uh, this equation, or e this is the equilibrium constant K, that is actually, sorry, K should, should have been here the capital K because small K is always rate constant. So that's a mistake. So uh, what happens is that it's actually the ratio of concentration in the uh, aqueous phase and organic phase you take, right? So similar is the condition. Now, when in your HPLC, the mixture of compounds are flowing in the eluent, so the eluent is actually your mobile phase, right? That is what did I say? That will be much more polar phase, right? Because in reverse phase, it is the mobile eluent is much more polar. And your stationary phase, which is actually this silica, and this is the C18 chain, that is a non-polar chain, right? So at every instantaneous time when it is flowing, this will, these two compounds will actually, just like in separatory funnel, it will actually having a flow system where it will either go into here or it will come here. So definitely what will happen, this one will actually, uh, will be poorly retained over here and this will rather like to come in the mobile phase, right? And then it will actually move ahead. So that is why from the HPLC, you always get the polar compounds coming out of the HPLC column first, right? So this probably given, uh, uh, give you a good perspective perspective to you know correlate what you know and what you can now go for learning right so this is a typical schematic of your hplc uh, you already what you do is that it's just like that this is your column so somehow you have to load your mixture of compound right so what you do is that you you take a pump and then you have a reservoir of uh, let's say solvent and then that pump will do you know it will actually pick up the uh, Reservoir, it will pick up the solvent and it will pass through uh, the column. And in the meantime, there will be a loop where you have provided your sample. You can actually, with a robot, you can inject the sample or you can always, um, you know, manually inject it, just like you do in column chromatography. So it just actually goes through. And in the column, they get separated. And that you can change, that I'm going to come, how you can separate it out. And once they come out, Using some detector, you can actually figure out, yes, there are two, three different things. So basically with time, or let's say the amount of the solvent, you can actually plot the data, which you actually find it over here. So if you are looking through UV, so you will see something like this. This is typically an HPLC chromatogram. And you can see that if you plot with the time, that is the you know, retention time, you can see that you have one, two, three, four, five, five uh, particular peak, they might have to do with five different compounds which are present. And also there may be some, these are maybe some of the impurity which might be present. All right. So this is how typically HPLC chromatogram looks like, right? And now if I talk about this detector, you also should know about this detector because uh, uh, in HPLC, there are multiple detectors you can put. Uh, so one of the most prevalent one is actually the absorbance based detector. That means if your compound is UV active, that means they will, uh, you know, they can be detected through it. Now, uh, earlier days, you know, when um, this HPLCs used to be there, you might have only two channels. Maybe you can only record UV at 254 and 200, let's say 80, right? Now, how do you know that you probably have different compounds and uh, they may not absorb there. They might absorb in something like 400 nanometer or so. That means you have to run again and different setting another wavelength, right? So that used to be a problem in typical single or double wavelength detector. So after that, I think something called um, something like PDA came. Uh, so um, this is like, you know, you can record an entire wavelength at one single run of HPLC. And that is actually done by, you know, passing the uh, light through the flow cell. That means that's where, uh, you know, in, in, this is like a cuvette in the HPLC. And you can actually have a diffraction grating, which will actually give you the photodiode array, which is PDA, uh, where you can, with a single run of HPLC, you can actually have all the different wavelength presence. So you can just choose and you can find out that where your compounds are, which, I mean, if you have uh, products or compounds with characteristic UV, you can actually find it out. And it gives you a hint where which particular peak maybe is due to compound A and which one is due to compound B. So that is more by far more prevalent one. But if you also attach fluorescence detector, I think all of you would be knowing about fluorescence. If your molecule is fluorescent, then you can actually detect. Now, these are some of the things. And the another one is this 
prevalent one is this mass spectrometric detector, which is what we are going to discuss maybe after uh, you know 10 minutes or so. I'm when I'm going to discuss a different aspect of mass spectrometry, right? So you will learn about it as we go along. Now you might always ask me the question that uh, what happens, sir? I mean, okay, I don't have any fluorophore in my molecule, but how do I get? So then I would not get any signal in your HPLC chromatogram. So what will be the way out? Now for that kind of uh, compounds, what you, what you should do is that you should, all, you should use something like refractive index detect, uh, detector or ELSD or evap evaporated light scattering detector, right? Now, uh, let me just uh, give you uh, a brief about what are they. So like, you know, refractive index detector means when you are passing through your column, let's say a solvent, um, something like, you know, you are passing water. Okay, so when only water is going, so water has a particular refractive index, all of us we know, right? Now, as soon as you, you have your compound coming out of the column and it is going to the detector, the detector will sense the refractive index of the compound. Okay, so definitely if some sample is coming, then it will say that, oh, there is something. So it will give a peak. So that's how you can actually find it out. But the problem with the refractive index detector is that if you have a mixture of solvent and you are running the column with a mixture of solvent, then refractive index based detector, it will not work. So this particular detector, you can only work if you have a isocratic, isocratic uh, flow. What, that means single solvent flow or single, you know, if you are make a mixture of it, then it has to be like, you cannot change the solvent composition, right? That's very important. So many cases when you do HPLC, that's not the case because we have to go for a gradient or solvent composition also changes with time. And if that is so, then what we need to do is that we need to run an evaporative light scattering detector. And what we do in that is that, so what happens is that if from your column, your compound is coming out as you see over here. And what we do is that we pass through, pass that particular droplets uh, through a nebulizer gas, which is a non-reacting gas like argon or nitrogen or something like that. What it does is that it actually evaporates these uh, droplets. And as it evaporates these drop droplets, it actually comes to a very small particle like thing, which will contain your, um, which will contain your, you know, the particular analyte or compound which is coming out. And as soon as it comes out, it will actually, it will give you a, it will pass through a light scattering cell. And then because of light scattering, basically you will get a signal. That's what I want all mean to say. So that is also possible. And this is very robust. And that will give you signal. Let's say if you have no chromophore in your molecule, you can easily find out using ELSD detector in HPLC. All right. Now, another important thing. Sometimes what happens is that you can, depending on your analyte, you can actually choose different kind of column. HPLC columns are different. Okay. Now, what I talked to you about, that is actually something called C18 column. But it's C18 column, that is something like this one. Okay, so basically you have this silica and you see how silicates. So on the silica, you have this C18 chain, which is attached. Okay, now you might also have a C8 column or you have a C4 column or you might have actually nothing, right? So you see, when you have uh, the variation of column and if you have to separate this five analytes and if you are passing through these different different columns you see in this particular case the separation of this compound is much better so you should go for such thing this is not a good separation because yeah it, it will be it, it can show you the separation but if you have to isolate that means you have to do not analytical hplc rather semi prep or preparative hplc where you can isolate the compound that is not a good uh, column to work with so you can choose your column based on the polarity and uh, non-polarity of the analyte, right? So regarding that, I also want to introduce a little bit, um, you know, de into details is that you, you can, I think uh, maybe you don't know about this term about something called capacity factor. So it's very important to know about the capacity factor of a column. So this is a typical column, right? Mm, and then what happens is that uh, you are passing the solvent through uh, and also the your mixture of compound through it, right? And in HPLC chromatogram, when you inject it, you will see first, 
you will get a peak like this. Sometimes many people, they don't know what is this peak. They think this is a compound peak. No, if you remember your TLC, TLC has always a solvent front. Do you remember so? Now, TLC has a solvent front. Similarly, you know, your HPLC, when one column volume is surpassed using this solvent, you get this peak, okay? That is coming off just after injection. This is what happens. And suppose if you have two compounds, one is giving a retention time at around 2.8, another one is giving at seven, then how you can find the capacity factor for each peak? Now capacity factor for, the, and this is called dead volume, which is like a equivalent to solvent front in your TLC. And so you can actually have something like, you know, t retention time for this particular uh, peak minus dead volume divided by dead volume. And for this particular one, it is actually uh, seven minus um, uh, this, uh, th th this particular time, that is the dead volume time, and then divided by this dead volume time. So you can see, you can find out the capacity factor. So capacity factor for the first case, you see 0.4, and the second compound case, it is actually 2.5. Now I introduce this term. Now what is the physical significance of this capacity factor? And whether what you want when you want to do an HPLC, do you want your capacity factor to be high, low? This is a typical question which might arise in your mind at this moment. Now, capacity factor actually talks about how many times, so this is actually the schematic I have given you in the column, how many times your column has to be swept with the mobile phase to elude this particular analyte. Suppose, so this particular, the green one, if you look at, it has a capacity factor of 2.5. It means if one column is like this, that means you need to sweep the column with 2.5 times of this column volume of solvent in order to get this peak out, okay? Or if you are talking about capacity factor 0.4, that means you hardly require around 0 0.5, 0 0.4 volume, column volume of solvent just to get this thing out, okay? So this is very important. So if the capacity factor, I will come to that in a minute. Now let's look at it. So sometimes many of the people have this fascination. I mean, let me when give you the idea about isocratic and gradient. Many people start with, you can see, you have been given, uh, let's say, a mixture of compounds, a number of compounds, eight compounds or so. And this is particularly prevalent, not for you, particularly when you are working in a pharma company or you have many ingredients in, the, in your formulation and you want to find which one is coming when. So you need to really have a very good separation. You see, many people have a habit, no, 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 let's run in isocratic illusion. Okay, now in isocratic illusion, what you do is that you keep the solvent composition throughout the time same. So you run in 30% methanol and 70% aqueous, which has been depicted in the color code, and you run like that, okay? And you do see that some of the compounds, they come out first, but then eventually your last compound, because nothing should be trapped in column, you have to get everything out. The last compound is coming, which is around, let's say 40 minutes or so, right? 39 minutes or so. So you can find out the capacity factor here. You see the first compound has a very low capacity all right, so first compound has a capacity factor pretty low, but uh, you see this is 39.2. That means you will use a lot of solvent. That means if your one column volume is something like 10 ml, you will actually use something like almost 400 ml of your solvent if you're running and separating using isocratic illusion. On the other hand, you know, if you're smart, what you would do is that you will do a gradient illusion where you will start with little lower percentage of methanol uh, acetonitrile and you will gradually change the acetonitrile percentage over time. And you can see if you do so, you actually get much better separation over here, which is spread and that can be also finished in 30 minutes instead of let's say almost like 50 minutes. So you are actually saving 20 minutes of your work time, right? If you are smartly doing things and uh, you are also saving a lot of this uh, solvent. So 20 minutes of solvent, if you're running one ml per minute, let's say, so you can save, many of these are very expensive, you know, HPLC or mass grade solvent. You can actually save something like, uh, you know, 20 ml of solvent, that's, that cost a lot. 
So I hope you understood why I actually introduced the capacity factor you know, for you uh, to understand in a much better quantitative way. Okay, now when I discuss uh, about HPLC, now our final goal is to go to, you know, understanding mass, right? But without HPLC, we cannot go to mass. So now all this partition-based mechanism, which I just discussed and, uh, you know, showed all the different capacity factor, that is actually applicable for small molecule, right? In the small molecules, what happens is this partition happens. So you have the silica, you know, particle and you have the CA18 ligand and you have this mobile phase, which is flowing this side. And then what happens is that you have the red one and the you have got the blue compounds. And what happens is the red compound is actually, you know, moving ahead because red compound is more polar and it actually like to stay in mobile phase more. You see more number of products or uh, compounds are in mobile phase. That's why it's actually moving faster. But in the blue one, you see, they're actually staying much lower. And this is very prevalent. You can see that, uh, you know, if you're running this in, um, you know, with uh, this is typical uh, isocratic, if you are running the 70%, if you run, they will come very fast. You know, 50% if you run, they will come rather slow. And you see blue will be always trailing behind this red one because red one will be more polar and it will come out first. And similarly, if you run in different, different isocratic volume, it's like this, you know, the HPLC trace is like that. So you can get an idea how your capacity factor changes. That means for the small molecule or peptide, because it does a partitioning mechanism, what happens? You're gradually changing this capacity factor with the percentage of one of the solvent, which is in this case, acetonitrile in the mixture of water acetonitrile. And you see that you always get a trace like this for different compounds. And this is true for the small molecule and peptide. So we understand it very well and we know how they behave in HPLC chromatogram, right? But what happens in the case of protein? And this is why I'm saying is that when you talk about HPLC column, they will be also given a pore size of this column. And they are actually comparable. But if you are talking about a protein or something like that, the proteins are actually very big molecule, right? It's a, it's a big polymer. And many times the protein is so big that it actually cannot really go inside this, uh, you know, the hydrophobic uh, tail of the end cap silica. That is very difficult. So they have a different mechanism. So what happens is the protein will have uh, let's say the hydrophobic or hydrophilic patches. And what it does is that it doesn't really go inside. It rather actually, it you can use these, you know, hydrophobic patches as the foot, okay? And using these feet of the protein, they walk on the uh, surface of the um, this chain, right? And that's how it happens. Now, that is why when you look at the capacity factor versus the percentage of solvent, one of the plot, you do see that in the case of small molecule, there is something like a very gradual, you know, uh, change in the capacity factor. But if you take, let's say proteins, three of the protein I have shown here, one is insulin, another one is lysozyme, another one is my myoglobin. You see, it doesn't really, none of them show a gradual change. It actually shows sudden drop of the uh, sudden drop in the capacity factor at a particular particular uh, you know the solvent composition this actually suggests that you know this these are probably working with the uh, non covalent interactions with the hydrophobic and it's a van der waal interactions but as soon as you actually cross this particular critical percentage of methanol it actually breaks that interaction and it actually takes it takes you uh, through it's you break the hydro that van der Waal interaction because you are increasing the non-polar content and that is why it is quite rapid uh, you know change so this is how the protein gets separated in the hplc column and definitely another thing you have to remember that when you are doing a protein um, separation using hplc uh, you must have a bigger pore size as well okay in many cases i think you also use um, you know gel uh, electro uh, not electrophoresis uh, this is actually gel permeation chromatography as well just like in polymer which is uh, what i will discuss in case i get a chance later on because that also we specialize on okay now 
So we learned about HPLC, right? And we did see that we can generate nice separation and chromatogram and all this. But then, you know, the development and the science of chromatography did not stop over there. So we were, you know, we are getting increasingly loaded and we would like to see something, the peaks which you are separating in one hour, can we really separate in 10 minutes so that we can save our time and also solvent? Okay, now, so what happens? And, uh, and many of the pharmaceutical form formulation, if you see, you will have maybe, you know, uh, more than 20, 30 peaks. Sometimes, even if you are running for two hours of HPLC chromatogram, you cannot get a very nice separation. And that has to do with the resolution of the peak. In many cases, sometimes you may end up with this. There is one peak over here. Another peak is coming just like that. So there are some area where there is a mixing, right? And that, if you understand it inside the HPLC column, these are all HPLC particles. One thing is that from column to HPLC, when we moved on, we actually got the benefit of the regular shape, but the size was not uniform. If you want to make the size uniform, definitely that HPLC column price will actually go higher. But the problem is that when you pass your uh, solvent if in such kind of column where you have uh, size uh, quite not that so uniform, you can see that you can have different solvent path. The path length will be different. So this will be much more straight. But if you follow this red trace, it will have a little different path. So then what will happen? You will create a band. And that is what is actually manifested here in full with that half maximum for this particular case. But you see, when you have a, a narrow particle distribution like this, but they are rather poorly packed, then you actually get a better situation than this one. But still, you know, they can further be improved. But if you can make them very nicely and well packed, then you actually eventually you get into a situation they're very smaller and also nicely packed. You get a resolution like this, which is very good. These two peaks are nicely separated. And this is what is called ultra high pressure liquid chromatography. And this is different from HPLC because here in HPLC particles are normally, you know, more than five micrometer or 10 micrometer, something like that. But if you are doing UPLC, they will be less than two micrometer and they will have a very narrow particle distribution. And this diffusion or, you know, the eddies diffusion, what we call that does not take takes place and uh, you actually get very nice, um, you know, separation as compared to all these other cases, of course, there is also price which we have to pay for, but your analysis of very complex mixture becomes very easy and it can be done in less time. And this is a typical example for that. This is a typical HPLC where you can see that you have multiple peaks. This is the real life situation when I suppose the pharmaceutical companies have been asked to you know, analyze some real sample, you get something like that. But you see, that particular resolution gets eventually better when you are running, running with UPLC and many of the peaks are very sharp. And each of these might really correspond to different, different chemicals, uh, chemical means, I mean, compounds. Now, how do you know which one is which, right? And in order to know that we need to do mass. So I will come after two, three slides and we'll enter mass. Now, another very interesting thing you will note it. Okay. And this is, this I want to tell you because I think there will be, you must be all using HPLC. Someone must be using HPLC. But I think I want to also, you know, give you an idea about HPLC here that uh, if sometime you see that uh, you would see that there is this particular analyte which is coming very nicely. But then you do see that there are some certain analytes which will have this peak tailing. This is a typical situation you may end up with. And that actually, you know, the, that actually makes your analysis very difficult because if that is also coming in the same time, then there will be a mixing, okay? And why does it happen? That happens because, you know, re remember, most of the silica-based stationary phase uh, that we are running, that is two to the pH, we are running two to 7.5. Okay, that means it is rather, little acidic pH and if you are this particular particularly come when your analyte is little bit basic that means many of the amine so amines are there in many of the you know important biomolecules peptide also right and so what happens is that if you're running then they get protonated and as soon as they are protonated so there will be two species which are there one is the deprotonated species 
another one of this uh, another one is the protonated species and definitely if you have a protonated species which is a which is becoming uh, ionic in nature so ionic protonated species and the silica which is a negatively charged uh, you know stationary phase they will bound very strongly and that is why you get to have this peak tailing so what is the way out for getting this you need to then you know if you know that you are getting something like that so you need to add certain additive into the system which will make sure that it may be basic additive in this case maybe a little bit of triethylamine or so that will make sure that uh, you know this uh, becomes neutral like neutral and it actually comes out so there will not be any tailing so it's very important this this is basic basic fundamental understanding of acid base chemistry that also plays a significant role uh, in the hplc and this is what i wanted to tell you if you have a neutral molecule and you are passing through hplc let's say and whatever be the pa ph of the eluent sometimes you put additive right and i will tell you why we put additive in the mass so if you are putting neutral the, if the compound is neutral it doesn't matter it always comes and there is no tailing or anything you get to see and they don't change their retention time but the problem comes when you are actually doing some acid okay and acid will come because you might have a glutamic acid so in your let's say amino acid if you are separating or some other acid so what happened is that if if the you know like acetic acid what is the pk of acetic acid 3.4 right so if if your eluent is something like you know you are running in acetonitrile and water and you have put little bit of tri trifluoroacetic acid or let's say you know formic acid or something like that so and your you know eluent is actually low ph right so that means below 3.74 of acetic acid or something like that then what will happen is that it will stay in the protonated form in this particular case which is a neutral species and it will show very nice like this right but at pk what will happen it will be what is pk pk means it will be like an equilibrium where it is 50 50% of this species so the peak will get broadened right and if it is above the pk then that means what will happen if you have an acid as analyte this acid will get deprotonated and since it is deprotonated it will have an ionic interactions and because of ionic interactions um, you know it might you know in this particular case because it's coming in silica so you know it might come much beforehand okay but that's the opposite in the case of bases so normally at below pk the bases are very uh, polar because they have this electrostatic you know positively charged and then they will have a tailing of course in this case you have the tailing as well but then it will come out fa fast but at higher pk uh, at above pk and um, ph is higher than the pk it will be neutral species and it comes so when you are running a hplc for mass let's say and if you see such kind of thing don't get surprised you should know what is your you know you should analyze what is the nature of your compound and you can clearly then set up the column and the condition such a way you get a much better hplc chromatogram and you can analyze it in a better way so this is basically so this is something uh, when i was there in uh, troningen this was done in uh, there so as i was saying we sometime you know uh, so this is the typical peptides we are working with okay and this peptides have this you know the lysine unit which is pretty positive okay now what we are doing is that we were using with two different additive one is this trifluoro um, acetic acid which has the fluorinated chain so they get conjugated with this and they make it rather hydrophobic and since they are hydrophobic their retention time increases and you can actually see these peaks i mean different uh, you know the uh, uh, let's say uh, tetramer i am not going into detail of what how what are this tetramer pentamer different species it forms you can see it very nicely but if you change the additive to tfa to formic acid then what happens is that you don't get that uh, effect due to this fluorinated chain and what happens is that you know your entire mixture because this is very very you know polar and it actually comes immediately after this thing so there is a ion pairing which happens so this is this is how you can actually you know play with your chemistry and you can do very uh, you know interesting you can generate very interesting separation conditions and which is of fundamental understanding right 
So having said all this, let's, uh, uh, let's try to uh, understand the other specific detector for the HPLC. So we learned about UV detector, then, uh, uh, sorry. So we learned about this UV detector, then uh, ELSD detector. Similarly, let's learn about another kind of detector and which by far has actually carved out its own niche area called mass spectrometry. So the mass detector, uh, you can attach also, this is a typical water's HPLC, which is there with us. Mm, so what is there? Now let's understand. Okay, so what is there is that uh, you have the solvents over here. So next is what solvents, you have to use a pump. The pump is actually over here. And that what happens is that the solvent through this pipeline, it actually takes using the pump, it actually pass through a loop. And this is where you have many of these sample vials where you take your sample solution, it pass through in the loop. And then you tell that, okay, I want to inject this particular sample. Automatically if through the auto sampler, it will inject and it will put it into your, you know, that solvent eluent. And it will eventually, you know, get into this column. Column is kept over here. Okay. And the, it will pass through the column where it will get separated. And as soon as it gets separated here, I can show you there are two detector. One is this is actually your um, PDA detector. That means the UV detector. First, it will pass through the UV detector. Similarly, some portion of it will be passed through. This is actually your mass detector. Okay. And you can actually pass through mass detector. And in the mass detector, you can, using the mass detector, you can uh, actually, you do certain things, which I'm going to come to. You ionize the molecule and you generate some ions from one particular compound you generate so, and you can you can see uh, in your computer that what is that peak, whether it is expected mass or something, and you can actually analyze. So this is, you can see the mass detector itself is looking like a separate you know, instrument, but that needs to be coupled with the HPLC for faster data analysis. Of course, you might also argue with me that, sir, can I do like this? Let me do an HPLC or column, what do we do? We separate each and every fragment, fine. So you have got five uh, chemicals or compounds you have synthesized and you actually separate them, take each of every one, and then you pass directly in the mass. Can I do so? Yes, you can do so. And you can see there are this little bit of, you, you know, vial like this, this is all called direct infusion. So if you have a pure compound, yes. If you only have pure compound, you can put it over here and it will actually take, take the mass machine will take it and uh, you know it can pass through and ionize and you can directly do this is called direct infusion method in mass but i would not recommend you to do because many cases if you have certain amount of impurity this ionization chamber in the mass will get contaminated and then the next person who comes for recording mass will always get the product which was your impurity right in the, they, so that's why you should not do you should always couple it in hplc and then at one go, you can actually get mass of all the four different products. You know which one is what, right? Then whichever you want, then you can do column and get it out. It's as simple as that. So you save time as well, okay? So I think uh, this much is clear. But now I would rather ask a question that, uh, what do you measure in mass spectrometry? Okay, what do you measure? Exact mass or average mass? So. So this is my question to you. I, maybe, I mean, I want it to be a little interactive. So what do you measure in mass? Do you measure the exact mass so, or the average mass? Participants can write the answer in the chat box. Yeah, let it be interactive then. Yeah, that will be nice. So I will not wait for that. I let me just go ahead with it. So yeah. So what is exact mass and what is average mass? So this, is, this slide actually tells you that. See, when you talk about carbon, right? Carbon is an element. So carbon will have, we know that they have two isotopes. Okay, there can be more, but in this case, I'm just uh, considering, uh, let's say C12 and C13, okay? Now, what is the, and all of us, we know that in UPAC nomenclature, the exact mass of carbon 12 is taken, right? And uh, that is 12.000 for the carbon 12 isotope and for the C13 isotope, it is something like this, right? And uh, what is the percentage abundance of it? 
carbon 12 is actually 98.9% abundance you get to have and C13 is very low. But it, of course, we run also C13 NMR spectra, that's a different thing. But if we now take this abundance in picture and you do a typical unitary method, so you basically multiply this into this plus this into this divided by you know the average uh, this mass you take and you actually get the average mass something like 12 point this 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 right this is a average atomic weight of carbon and based on that if you if i give tell you that okay tell me uh, similarly if for the case of hydrogen is also like that one and two uh, something you look at the percentage abundance okay this is very different but if you look at sulfur sulfur has actually three and the percentage abundance is actually the 34 is actually quite a lot why i am saying it and you can actually find out something like the average mass this average mass is something which when we are talking about molecule suppose these are all element right now if i tell you h2o right h2o means if you are taking all hydrogen as one one then two and oxygen as 16 then we know that you know the uh, you know the molar mass of uh, your h2o will be something but if you are taking this average thing into you know consideration for can calculating h2o molecular weight molecular weight of h2o will be different because there you actually take into account all the percentage abundance of different isotope right so there is something called exact mass and there is something called average mass average mass is equivalent to this molecular weight what you get. and then exact mass is the one where you take only that particular isotope only one type of isotope. Okay, that's very clear. So in mass spectrometry, what we do, what we can actually get, whatever peaks you get, they are actually due to this exact mass. They are not due because one particular in one particular molecule, you will have, let's say, one particular isotope present and you will get peak due to that. If there is also another molecule of that and you have another isotope present of, let's say, carbon, you will get another peak. Right, so you get actually the exact mass. I hope it is clear. This is what I wanted to stress. Then you know why you get so many peaks. We will come back. So this slide, we are going to come back when I discuss about some of the applications and stuff like that. But before that, let us understand how and what is the basic principle of mass spectrometry. Okay, so in mass spectrometry, suppose, uh, you have got one particular compound and uh, that needs to be the mass of which needs to be checked. So that you have to, what are the different steps? You have to introduce the sample and the sample introduce the introduction can be happen in pure phase or mixture phase. As I said, if it is pure, you can directly infuse it and you can go ahead. But if you are having a mixture of compound, you have to pass through a uh, column which is what you are doing uh, HPLC. If it is a liquid one, then you are doing HPLC. But if you are doing, let's say, if, if this is like you are analyzing, let's say, alcohol, different things which are present in alcohol or let's say fragrant. So you, these are all volatile stuff, then you cannot do HPLC. Then what you need to do? You need to do a gas chromatographic column you have to pass through, okay? And whatever mass you do, that is called GCMS. Since I have been asked to do specifically focusing on HPLC, so I'll keep it on liquid chromatography, right? So you can have this, that's why you can have this gas, liquid, or solid phase, different, different way of introductions. Okay, then what happens after the introduction of the sample? The sample will come through, pass through, let's say, the so column, or, you know, it will be coming to the ionization chamber. And this is one of the most important thing. The sample needs to be your molecule, compound needs to be ionized. If it does not ionize, you will not get mass. Okay. So many times you have seen that, you know, you are trying all different methods. You know, your NMR is showing, but you are not getting. So there is a problem with the ionization. And that is what you have to play around with. And that is the fun in doing mass spectrometry. Okay. So now there are two ways of doing ionization. Okay. Uh, so earlier day, uh, like universal or selective. And this is what I, is very important. There are actually hard ionization, which, which we have been using for last, let's say, you know, 30, 40 years. But only in last 10, maybe 15 years, we are using something called soft ionization. And that is what is very important. And I'm going to talk to you in a slide or so. Now, once you ionize your 
compound of interest and it ionizes and it can start move, moving if you apply a voltage or potential. And that is what you do. And now one molecule may give different kind of ionization species. That is also another problem. So what you need to do is that such ionization species, even though they are coming from a single molecule, that needs to be separated. And that this part is normally done in vacuum. And this is all, this is actually the part which is responsible for imparting resolution of your mass spectra. Okay. And how fast you can record the mass. Okay. And this only dictate what is the M by Z. This is normally separation is done by the mass by the charge ratio of the species. And this actually dictates the M by Z range. Okay, and many other things in which are important in proteomics. I'm not going to go much in details because this is keep keeping. I'm keeping it simple because of the many of the college students who are present here. Okay, and then you do the data processing using some software, right? This is what actually your mass spectrometer consists of. Now let's talk about the ionization part first. As I said, that. You can do ionization in um, normally in gas phase or the recent one which we'll discuss in condensed phase. So anyway, gas phase, what happened is that you take your sample, you heat it up and put it in sample vapor and they will be putting in a chamber and you can do this electro ionization, EI or chemical ionization and it will, it will make the sample ion which you will take further for analysis, right? This is one of the things. The other one is actually you can ionize, ionize from a very condensed droplet state, state and from the droplet state, you can actually analyze. So this is what is actually soft ionization. This is actually your hard ionization, okay? And um, so if you look at the field desorption and fast atom bombardment, these are actually things which are hard ionization and which is what people used to do earlier. But recently, these are actually this ESI electrospay ionization or matrix assisted laser desorption ionization. These are things which has come as a soft ionization, as I was saying here. This has actually you know, resulted a Nobel Prize in 2002. Okay, I'm going to come there, that discussion. So this has actually revolutionized the field, particularly for the biomolecules and many of the macromolecules, right? So, well, so what do we see? In the electro ionization, as I said, that you, know, you heat the sample and make the sample vapor. And what you do is then you pass high, Elect, high energy electron beam. Now what happens is that the high electron in, in a, um, energy beam, they actually knock out one electron from the molecular, the molecule, and it actually generate another electron. So what happens is that you have a neutral species, which has just come out from your column and you have taken and made it the sample vapor and you put a high, high energy electron and it actually makes this radical anion, radical cation, okay? And this radical cation is actually positively charged. You can also make a radical anion, okay? That also is possible and that, that's what actually dictates uh, you know, the mode of the ionization. Now, but more importantly, what I want to say is that these are all very high energy electron. Now, if you have your sample over here and you are bombarding with it, it's not only that it will actually make your um, molecular ion, but the molecular ion will not be also stable because what happens? Uh, the kinetic energy of the electrons are very high. And typically for ionizing this thing, you need hardly 10 kV, 10 EV of electron. But what happens to this additional 60 EV of electron volt of electron you're putting through? That means it is very high, like, you know, 6,000 kilojoule per mole. And it, you can think of you're analyzing an organic molecule, which is where you have the CC bond or CH bond strength is hardly 400 kilojoule per mole. So that, that means this molecular ion doesn't stay stable and it actually gets chopped off into fragment uh, species. And this is what happens. It actually gets further, uh, you know, you started, but this is what you wanted, but it actually further gets cleaved and you might, uh, you know, form, and it can also do many of the organic rearrangement reaction and all this. So that means earlier days, what electron ionization people used to do that you know, is pretty complicated because you need to have a very sound organic chemistry knowledge to figure it out if you are getting multiple fragmentation, what are the possible reactions which are happening in the gas phase, right? So that makes it always complicated analysis. So then people came up with something called um, chemical ionization. So in that chemical ionization, what you do is that you have still the sample vapor over here, but what you do is that you pass some 
reactant gas okay this is reactant gas like your methane or let's say ammonia you pass through it and your hot electron beam is coming now what happens because of the presence of this reactant gas the hot electron beam what it will do it will actually ionize this particular reactant gas first okay and this is the typical ion molecule reaction as we call it can fall this ch4 plus dot um, and then that will eventually successive reaction and it, will, it might form something like this and this particular one with your you know sample ion which you want to analyze this might result in a you know gas phase acid based chemistry and it will make something like mh plus similarly if you are using ammonia it will also do something like that gas phase you know mh plus and this is something is good because now what happens your excess energy you are supplying in the from the filament through the electron they are as uh, they are consumed by this reactant gas and then they are subsequently ionizing the sample ion species so this is what is very important and that is why you know it is good to have a little bit of acidic or basic you know additive into the hplc because that makes things better for conducting this so this is a typical you know this is uh, this is where the first you know big shift happened when people started doing this oh okay we don't need to really go to this high vacuum state we can do these things in atmo atmospheric pressure chemical ionization where from your liquid chromatography let's see your mass uh, i mean your samples are coming and what you do is that not you actually using a nebulizer gas now nebulizer gas um, you put and then you can actually form this small small droplets and now uh, through these droplets you actually take them in this uh, source where you actually can ionize it and after the using corona discharge you can ionize this and after you ionize this species uh, you can actually take those ions to the analyzer where you actually separate it right i'm going to come to that so this is this become the first uh, you know change and this is what i wanted to say let's say you know cocaine cocaine you want to check like you know uh, you, you have found there are some drugs okay so what is this we need to quickly check right so cocaine of course you can always do the you know typical heterocyclic compound and you can do always nmr but if you want to do let's say mass and cocaine has a molecular uh, uh, exact mass of 303 3, but what happens if you are doing in electro ionization mode then what happens there is you you do see that your max major amount of peak which is 100% abundance that you get at 82 or 182 is the second uh, you know highest predominant peak but you don't get actually your molecular ion peak and this is happening exactly because you are using electron ionization with high, very high energy so frag because of fragmentation it is forming but because of further fragmentation it is actually forming this kind of and this is happening because you know your this particular ester bond is getting cleaved right so but then when you use uh, chemical ionization using let's say ammonia then use uh, so not a methane gas you do see that yes that is right you have a m plus h form that is 304 you are getting apart from that you do still have this you know the benzoic acid which is actually going out of the system it is still there and that is why you get to have this 182 peak m by z mm, but then if you are using a little bit of ammonia into it so you can further you know make it better um, and you see that your molecular ion peak becomes then more prominent so this is how you can actually play around with the energy of your Mm, uh, you know fragmentation and you can get your mass peak and this is what people used to do even i have also done when i was doing my phd back in 2000 or so but uh, so <clears throat> another important thing i wanted to tell you you can also have positive chemical ionization or negative chemical ionization and this is how you can actually have different species so i will come to it in much more details let's not discuss it here in details it will you will be on board later on so here, so then one of the other interesting things, so this, uh, what I discussed is the hard ionization. Now the soft ionization is the one which is what makes things better. Okay, and uh, these three gentlemen got the Nobel Prize for this. So what you do is that uh, from your HPLC, you have a sample solution which is coming. And then what you do using uh, the potential, you actually make these uh, small, small droplets or aerosols charged. And eventually, using nebulizer, you actually make the sample anion, sample ions, 
and you can make sample cation, sample anion, whatever. And then that, based on that charge, you can actually take it to mass analyzer and you can analyze it with the detector. So this entire part can be done in atmospheric pressure. Only the mass analyzer requires vacuum. Okay, so this is the typical one. I mean, this is coming from liquid chromatographic, um, you know, source. It actually passed through this anode, which is positively charged. So basically, and you can see there is a very pinhole like system and you actually get these uh, droplets only which are coming out and droplets are, uh, now this is anode and this is positive and, and this is negatively charged. So definitely you form these positively charged ions, which eventually goes towards this uh, particular uh, cathode. Okay, so now if you look at only this particular part, this is called Taylor's cone. And as when you are passing this small, small, you know, the offspring droplet, there is a charge accumulation which is happening. And now that is, since that is connected using a potential, you actually have multiple positive charge accumulation in single droplet. Now these are unstable. That's why there is droplet fission, what happens. And then what you get is this, 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 you get this offspring sample ions which are present, which actually are then taken over to the mass analyzer. Okay, is that clear? And this is how you actually do very nicely. And you can think of that if you now put little additive in your, you know, LCL, uh, you know, liquid chromatography, this process of forming charge becomes much better. So you need to ionize your species. This is what I also again wanted to show you. So from this Taylor spoon droplet, you get something like that charge accumulation. And then eventually use the, using the nebulizer, you can uh, evaporate the solvents and you actually get very small 10 nanometer sample ions, which actually pass through the, from ionization that they, they will be taken into, this is called analyzer, okay? So this is where you actually separate the M by Z, uh, different, different ions. Right, and this is what is very important because you must be hearing about, you know, we what is the machine you have? You Someone says that we have single quadruple. Someone says that, no, we have triple quadruple. Someone says, no, we have iron trap. Mm, ESI iron trap. That means ESI means electrospay ionization is happening, but the iron trap is the analyzer you have. Or someone says that, oh, we have cut off or time of flight. So this is actually different. This is nothing but different method to separate all those ions you have gener generated in the ion chamber, they get separated based on their M by Z range. Okay, and this is what is very important and this actually dictates the resolution of the mass spectrometer. Okay, this analyzer, mass analyzer. Okay, you can see that time of flight is having a pretty high you know, resolution, almost 20,000 as compared to some of the quadruple, right? So these are the things which are important and uh, just to, I don't want to take you in much detailed. Uh, this is uh, typically, you know, these things as I was talking about quadruple ion trap, time of flight, they, so what is their job? They have to separate the ion and how do they separate it? That is the underlying principle. Okay. One of the separation is done in space according to their M by Z uh, or the time of location. So it's like a race. There are different ions which are present. Now you have asked them, okay, go and touch. It's like a hundred meter sprint. So who reaches first? So based on the time, different, different ions will actually reach different time. Okay, that's how you can actually detect different ions and you can actually get different, different signal for different ions. Similarly, you can have also this, uh, you know, filtering. So it is like, you know, you have taken everything in a, all the ions in a pot and then you are providing some electromagnetic radiation and they are resonating, just like in NMR, they are resonating. And only when they resonate at a particular, uh, you know, signal, they will come out. Rest will be all trapped. So you are selectively filtering it out. So these are different, different technology. And based on that, you have the different analyzer present. I'm not going much into details. Let's go and look at one of the example. Here you can see this is linear quadruple. Linear quadruple means here in the source, you have generated the ion. Now, there may be multiple ions you have generated from one single compound. You might generate, right? Because you might have fragmentation, anything. Now, what is the thing you are passing to this quadruple? Means you have four poles, two are positive and two are negatively charged, and they are changing because you have put a, uh, you know, AC component onto it. They're changing at every moment. So as the ions, they come, they are, you know, they are resonating because they are resonating with this cos omega component. 
and the only the ions which will resonance will have a very nice resonance with this particular one they will only come out and they will reach the detector similarly you can change uh, this omega t component you can change radio frequency if you change then at different time they will come out okay and that is how you can actually detect so this is the principle of low linear quadruple so definitely if i tell you like, okay tell me what is uh, you know triple quadruple so that means similarly it is one quadruple they will be in series three quadruple will be sitting and that's how you can actually separate it out so of course time is also another important thing just to scan this radio frequency how much time it takes and also these are different different aspect of it i'm not going to go much in nitty gritty on it but most important thing for you to look at is this you know the when you get a mass now this is a mass spectra where you it is not a hplc spectra in HPLC spectra, you got different, different peaks, but one of the peak you are analyzing to mass spectra, then you will get actually in X axis, you get M by Z. And this is where you get this ion abundance and you get a peak like this Gaussian shape, right? And you can find out the full width of half maxima. And you can see if it is really wide, then definitely resolution is poor, right? And this is what is dictated by different, different ion analyze, uh, mass analyzer like quadruple will have low resolution but if you are doing let's say q -top or orbit trap very high resolution that's because this delta m value that means full with that half maxima in this particular case is much lower all right so yeah so this is the case you will get this is a typical mass um, spectra you will get uh, for the same compound in different different mass uh, let's say if you are doing in quadruple or uh, you know the time of flight or orbit trap you see in orbit trap in mass spectra, which is this M by, M by Z, in the mass spectra, you actually get very nice peaks. And this is very good because sometime we would like to look at what is the isotopic, um, you know, the distribution for various, you know, advanced studies, we need to look at it. For that, you need to really look at such kind of thing. You know why I'm saying this isotopic? Maybe, you know, I come and then you found a dinosaur fossil. Okay, so what you do is that, you know, you take the sample and uh, dinosaur fossil means there will be some radioactive, let's see, 14 or something like that, uh, you know, uh, carbon will be there. So what you need to do, and you know, the half-life and all, you can always analyze that using mass spectrometry and you can see the isotopic distribution. But then in order to have that kind of, you know, C12, C13, C14, such isotopic distribution, what you need to have you need to have such kind of, you know, very nice resolution. If you have such kind of resolution, you will not have a very clear picture. That is why you, for different application, you might also think for different kind of resolution. For your typical organic chemistry synthesis and characterization, quadruple is much more, uh, I mean, and sufficient. All right. So another interesting thing, since we are talking about this kind of, you know, uh, resolution, Another important thing, if you have, let's say, in your molecule, if you have bromine, and you know bromine has two isotopes, which is 79 and 81, you see, unlike carbon, like 12 and 13, isotopic abundance is very low, right? But if you are having bromine, you will have isotopic abundance almost similar, right? And 79 and 82. And this is the thing what happens if, suppose, in your compound, if you are let's say, you know, recover, you know, you have got a compound, let's say bromobenzene and bromobenzene you are recording, let's say, uh, uh, something like uh, um, uh, mass, you will see there will be always two peaks which are uh, appearing, hmm. something like that. Or if you have a, uh, let's say chlorobenzene. So chlorobenzene, if you are taking a mass, you will uh, see, one of the isotopic abundance is three times, then other one is one times. Okay, so this is the ratio between isotopic uh, abundance for that. So this is how you can actually looking at the isotopic pattern. Also, you can say, look, yes, that means I have bromine in my compound or chlorine in my compound or something else, or I don't have anything uh, of that kind of compound. These are giving you very interesting uh, indications. So again, now this is what I actually told you before starting mass. This is why we need to know this uh, exact mass isotopic abundance much in a serious mode. All right. So, and this is typically, you know, this is acetic acid. And if you look at acetic acid, it's a rather small molecule. It has an exact mass. You expect that at 60, you will get it like that. And in fact, you do see a mass you do get for 60. 
But again, you might ask me that, oh, you get also something in 61 and 62. What are they? Any idea what are they? Anyone can say this? I'm almost at the end. Yeah, so they're actually the, you know, the carbon isotope, C13 isotope, that actually shows up over there. Similarly, if you are talking about stearic acid, here you have C18 carbon chain. So a lot of more carbon are there in this. And you do see that you get the monoisotopic peak over here. But then you also see that other one, the C13 isotope, they actually increase. You see, it becomes 20% almost of the 100% uh, abundance of the, you know, this uh, particular one where you have all the carbon C12. But here you get where you have at least one carbon is, you know, C13. That's why you get something like this. And that is quite obvious as you go on from small molecule to larger molecule. So definitely when you go from small molecule to larger molecule, you can see that your isotopic, you know, prevalence actually becomes a little different. Okay. This is something also you might notice when you are doing mass per biomolecules. Okay. Now, last important thing. I, before I go to Maldi is that, you know, you can do this electron spray, you can, when you are taking the additive, you know, using the additive, if you're taking acidic additive, you can make it, you know, M plus H, or you, if you, if you take a basic additive or something like that, you can also make M minus H. In many cases, when you have an acid uh, as an analyte, okay, so it, it might actually de get deprotonated and it can give, give you M minus H. But if you have an amine, in the quaternary ammonium compound, then normally it gets to get protonated and you see that positive mode. That's how you can run, you know, the mass in both ESI positive mode or ESI negative mode. So this is, you can run together and you can check. Sometimes you might not get in positive mode. You might have to look at in negative mode. Just like, now another interesting thing I just wanted to tell you. So this is, uh, this is the particular, uh, you know, compound. What do we see? This compound is already positively charged because of this quaternary ammonium uh, compound, right? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. You. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, we have 10 minutes uh, left. And uh, if you can finish in a couple of minutes, we can then take a, a couple of questions. All right. All right. I'm just finishing it here. So oh. if, if you are passing through it, then what happens is that uh, it might, you have another charge site. It can also get protonated over here. So because of this, so you can actually form doubly charged species. So this one will be, you know, M by Z at 557, you get on 558, you get this M plus H, but then you might also have doubly charged species. And because this is M by Z, you get at the half, exactly you get such kind of, uh, you know, at the half, this is actually M by uh, two species. Similarly, uh, in the case of, let's say protein myoglobin, protein means you have a lot of amino acid which are charged or not charged you have various charged species which are present in there that becomes very complicated, but you can actually deconvolute all, all of them and actually get the, you know, this particular mass of the protein. And this is a typical example I wanted to show for my one of my compound where you have double lysine. That means you might have doubly charged species. And if you have a doubly charged species, then you might not only get this uh, singly charged, uh, you know, M, M plus uh, H, you might also get just half of that, that is 4 o, you know, 480. And these are all different impurities which are present. So this is what I wanted to tell you. And not only that, um, you can also get M plus sodium peak as well, because sodium is also present in your uh, water. So what I told you is that if you have a non-polar compound, more or less you can go for this classical electroionization, or if you have a polar compound based on what kind of polar, the acid or let's say amine, you can go for either ESI positive or ESI negative. Now, having said that the last one minute, I want to spend it on MALDI, which is very, very important. And as you know, sometimes your protein and all, they're very difficult to pass through your, uh, you know, liquid chromatography. So what you do is that you do in solid phase. So what you do is uh, these are, uh, so you take in your uh, sample, uh, sample in a solid form and put it in a matrix. And you put a laser pulse and the as you put the laser pulse, it will generate some sample ions and these ions will be taken into the mass analyzer. And this is typically a MALDI it looks like. So everything is in solid phase. And typically the matrix, you take uh, this kind of matrix like HCCA, which is nothing but an acid, which
which can do a solid phase acid based transfer. You have the, all these matrix molecule and these are your analyte. You do the laser ablation and this do this solid phase charge transfer and you actually get this, uh, yeah, sample ions, which eventually, you know, go to this. Uh, so you do this with this kind of laser and you can analyze this. So this is much more softer process with this, uh, uh, you know, uh, with this laser. And this is typically, you can see this bovine serum albumin protein and you are ligating with something. You With this multi, you can see that uh, you can have multiple modification and the molecular weight of this increasing. It's not molecular weight, exact mass is increasing. And with the multi, you can also look at the polymer. This is a typical polyethylene oxide based polymer, which has a typical repeating unit of 44. And you can actually, you know, see very nice distribution of the polymer and you can actually tell, oh, this is a PEO based polymer. This is typical multi of it. So I wanted to leave it at that. And I, this is the, we have all these machines over here in case you now find it very interesting for using for your applications or your science. Feel free to you know look it up uh, in our uh, uh, central instrument facility, and these are all open for external users. So thank you, and I hope uh, you know if you have many questions, uh, I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Yeah. Uh Manjur, sir, you are Manjur, sir, unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, sorry. So, uh, thanks, uh, Professor Ashish, uh, for such a wonderful lecture. So, the first question is basically how to improve the efficiency of separation and study of compounds by relating with AutoCAD techniques. Relating with what? If there are AutoCAD uh, techniques. AutoCAD? Yeah. I don't understand, but I mean, uh, if you say that how to improve the separation, yeah, yeah, yeah. that I can um, tell you. Uh, uh, okay, okay. I think uh, that uh, the person is mentioning about a particular software for particular uh, agilent. Most software, probably, I think. most probably. I think you are talking about that. Okay, okay, I understood. So yeah, I mean, of course, uh, what you can do is uh, time to time. Uh, this is very important when you are doing an analy uh, analytical HPLC or you are doing a, um, let's say, uh, the preparative HPLC. So what you need to see is uh, 